Holman, welcome to the Truck Show Podcast Studio. It's episode number 214. 214. That is exactly 213 more episodes than people thought we would last. <laughs> That's more 213 episodes more than you and I thought we would last as we were sitting, hey, uh, coming up with the show how, in, how the, in the you? norms in Huntington how Beach. How dare you? By the way, I passed norms yesterday. I almost took a picture to post on our Facebook and said, this is where it all started. <laughs> but then I didn't get the, uh, the red light. Um, I thought we were going to be good for about five episodes and then just completely. Uh, you guys don't know this. Maybe we've joked about it before, but. Holman and I had no idea how we were going to make up 45 whole minutes of truck content. Like, what are we going to do for 40? Because our yeah. goal was to get to yeah. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah. That was going to be the hardest 45 minutes of our lives. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Now it sure still wasn't. is the hardest 45 <laughs> minutes because we can't keep uh, anything shorter than about eight hours. That's true. All right. Well, listen, on this episode, it's going to be a good one. We're checking in with Dan Worley of Suspension Direct Incorporated. You may have heard of SDI. They're out in Lake Elsinore, California, and they're responsible for the E-Click suspension system. It's basically a smart suspension for your Jeep JK, JL, JT, uh, Raptor, and they've got a, a bunch of new applications coming out. It plugs into your OBD system, and it's aware of your speed, your pitch, your yaw, and it predicts what you're going to be doing out in the desert or wherever you are. It's, it's a smart- adjustable suspension. Uh, sure, but it's like- it's, Active oh, sure. suspension. Act, it's active suspension, right. but- I don't know why you're trying to redefine what it is. But what I'm saying is it's aftermarket, meaning right. most active suspension comes with the truck. Right. right, so you can bolt these to your Jeep, yeah, and you can. There's a uh, button that goes on your shifter, and you can click through your settings, and then make it stiff or soft or whatever you want on the fly. Well, I can tell you that I went out there to Lake Elsinore, uh-huh. and I spent uh, almost three hours with Dan. Okay, and man, is it awesome! All right, so we also have to talk to our friend Jordan Mulbauer because uh, here there's some uh, big happenings with what was formerly known as, or the event formerly known as. Daytona Truck Meet. Yeah, so it's Daytona Truck Meet. <laughs> Scratch out the Daytona part. Yeah, so something happened. So uh, we're going to get into the show here, and we'll give Jordan a uh, call. And uh, you know, he's our uh, our favorite event promoter. So he's also our favorite ginger. Yeah, uh, second favorite. Who's our first? Angie Everhart. Angie Everhart. Yeah. No, crush Jordan. On her as a kid. Really? Oh yeah. Oh no, I was never an Angie Everhart. You, fan. you didn't like Angie? No, nah, I mean, I didn't. I didn't dislike her. I was just like, whatever. Just whatever. Yeah, it's whatever. Okay. Right. No, I'd rather lay on Jordan all day long. <laughs> and, you, and you have. <laughs> I might have. Uh, and we're also taking your five-star hotline calls. We're going to play them live on the air. And know your note is finally what? here. After like six months of you guys sending enough to where we can do a show? Great. For reals. <laughs> thank you. All right, so before we get started, let's thank our friends over at Nissan who make an awesome lineup of trucks. That's right, the Nissan Frontier, which just got redesigned for 2021, and the Nissan Titan and Titan XD. Of course, those come with the industry's best five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. Those are all the people that have bought Nissan trucks. There's a lot of them. I, I need you to do the uh, the boo real quick. Why? Why would I do a boo just, for Nissan? Just, just do a boo. Ooh. Those are all the tow truck owners who uh, never <laughs> uh, have to pick up a Nissan truck. Gotcha. Because they're so reliable. Touche. Hey, you know what the uh, front... <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all night. Try the veal. Tip your waitress on the way out. Boy, my arms are tired. I just flew in. Hey, um, you know what the Frontier and the Titan have in common? You guys don't know this. Hold on a second. <laughs> you guys don't know this, but at our upcoming event, which we haven't formally announced uh-huh. yet, we're going to be doing an event in, um, <clears throat> is it April, right? Yeah. April. Out in the desert, uh-huh. which we're going to welcome you to. Uh-huh. Holman is preparing an actual stand-up comedy routine. Yeah, but now you you I, I you ripped it from <laughs> my uh, you took the wind out of my sails. No, you're still doing it. No, yes, now, you now are. I feel like it's 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 fallen, fallen. Yeah, I, just because I, I said that you were doing it. No, just because you were so critical of it, I lost all my mojo. You're I uh, well, he's going to do it because you guys are going to help me pressure Holman into doing a stand up routine. Yeah, uh, I mean, I have a few jokes written and they were pretty good. Then lightning 15, 15 solid minutes, and then lightning's like, bleh, 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 bleh. but I don't see lightning writing jokes. I wasn't the one that came up with the idea that I would be on stage to uh intro that what you, you don't want to be my writer. I will help you. Well, I've, I've written the first handful of jokes, I need help. I will, I told you I'd help you. All right. Well, then okay. maybe I might do it. I can't wait for some right. stand-up from my man Back Holman. to Nissan. Yeah. You know what the Frontier and the Titan have in common? How about Fender Audio? Yeah, oh, yeah. Zero yeah. gravity seats. Great. Bill Stein shocks. Even better. Spray-on bedliner. Phenomenal. Utilitrack rail system in the back. Love it so By much. By the way, the Nissan Utilitracks, 
cast aluminum, not that plastic stuff that you get on the competitors. Yeah. You don't want the plastic. Listen, if I have my 500-pound Harley in the bed, I want to make sure that it's hooked up to a metal cleat and not a chintzy plastic Something one. that's going to rip out and leave your Harley on the on the highway. On the side. Oh, yeah. on the highway. Well, uh, could you imagine what that would sound like bouncing out of your bed? No. 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 What happened to Nissan? Because everything is uh, super stout. If you are looking for a new truck, head over to NissanUSA.com or your local Nissan dealer. Hey, Lighting. Yes, sir. If I want more flow... On my uh, <laughs> wait a minute, where's this going? If I want more flow uh-huh. on my Cummins, yes, where would I go? You'd go to bankspower.com and you'd look up Monster Ram. Wait, are you talking about the Gen 2 Monster Ram? You know, that red powder coated one with the machined logo on it that includes the high flow heater and billet intake plate for Ram Cummins? <laughs> Uh, well, yes, that's the one I'm talking about. Would, we are our acting is just awful. Would you say that the st- Stock elbow and heater kill airflow in your engine, but you can get back all that power you lose and gain a more responsive, power-efficient engine while improving airflow from the intercooler? And would you say that you could raise boost without increasing back pressure at the turbine? All those things are actually factual, yes. Would you say that you could slide on into your smog check in uh, 50 states? Absolutely. And hand them a carb EO on that bad boy? Mm, So you can pass smog all day long. Uh, Would you say that it does not fit a chassis cab? I would say that it is. How many of our listeners drive a chassis cab? <laughs> I bet a lot. I mean, some, some. All right, so here's the deal. The all-new Monster Ram intake elbow for the 6.7 Cummins. In your Ram lives up to its name. It's an absolute monster, and the bank's engineers pulled out all the stops when developing it. No tuning needed, 50-state compliant, and 100% performance. Nothing else comes close. If you look at the airflow, banks, 50-state, check. Oh, wait, wait no, I, we can do an actual ding for that one. Okay. CFM, 936 which is a gain over stock of, oh, by the way, just oh, to yeah, yeah, just put this in perspective, there is a, com- there's a company that provides negative gain. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> then there is a popular company that provides a very nice gain of 42 CFM. 42 CFM. 42. Mm-hmm. Banks, a little bit better at 515 <laughs> gain. That's the gain. Yeah, I Your know. gain is more than the stock CFM of the factory of a 421. And it increases manifold air density, which is what you really care about. The denser the air going into your cylinders, as we've talked about many times, the more power you can make. Your stock factory intake elbow is a throttle. It's a throttle. Yes, your engine can pull in the air it needs currently stock, but it has to work really hard to do so. Make your turbo's life a lot easier with the Monster Ram. Get all this and more from the Gen 2 Monster Ram at BanksPower.com. The Truck Show. We're going to show you what we know. We're going to answer what the truck. Because truck rides with The Truck Show. We have the lifted. We have the lowered and everything in between. We'll talk about trucks that run on diesel and the ones that run on gasoline. The Truck Show. The Truck Show. The Truck Show. Whoa, whoa. It's The Truck Show with your hosts, Lightning and Holman. Holman and Lightning. Nope. Lightning and Holman says so on the jingle. I... What do you want to do first? Do you want to get into Dan at SDI? No. You want to do some five star hotline? No. How about Jordan or No yes. Your Note? Oh, Jordan? He's on the East Coast. We got to call Okay, him. all right. Then that is going to take a jingle. Let's do. It's very possible it's past his bedtime, right? Where now. it's at, I think, is because uh, he's, uh, right? He's uh, an event. I don't think he's an event. Well, lighting. I mean, he, he yeah, he is. Jordan is an event. He's always an event. <laughs> is he an, an, uh-huh. an, a man who is an event. Jordan Mulbauer. Yes, sir. Giving him a call. Right now. Is this uh, Jay Bizzle and Sean Sizzle? It is. Hey, very nice. Nice. Strong. Do you like that one? Is that a good that was, one? That wasn't bad. Yeah, I like hey, that. Like that a lot. What bourbon are you drinking right now? Uh, I haven't had any tonight, amazingly oh. enough. What right. a letdown. What a letdown. I know. Mm. I know. What's the uh, best bottle you've acquired lately? Um, some uh, Weller Foolproof, actually, a store pick from Georgia. We uh, we, we did a trip two weeks ago up to Birmingham and uh, found a store that was just west of Atlanta. 
and uh, drove through. We're lucky enough to get a couple bottles out of there. So it was, that was a good score and a that good a retail good score. score, you know? All right. What was it called again? Yeah. Weller Foolproof. Weller Foolproof. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Hey, you're the only person I know that actually has more than one bottle of Old Forester uh, birthday bourbon on your shelf. At some point, I'm coming to Florida just to have a sip of the one that's open. Is that okay? Yes. How? I mean, I, I've heard it's exceptional, but I've never had it. It's good, but I definitely have way more bottles that are better than that. I will uh, I will test your, your bourbon palate uh, strongly. Oh, I like this. Interesting. Well, it's, you know, it'd be nice. He's thrown down the gauntlet. It it's would a be challenge. Well, I was gonna say, was gonna, it would be <laughs> nice if we had a reason to go to Florida, but since you canceled Daytona Truck Meet, now what? Now we're going to Homestead, Miami. What? What? Where is that? I've got four chrome rims and a steering wheel. Where is that? I've got four chrome rims and a steering wheel. Where is that? I've got four chrome rims and a steering wheel. Where is that? So, Jordan, you got to bring us up to speed now. What happened to uh, Daytona International Speedway? Who that, cares? He's going to freaking Miami. No, I'm just curious. And we're gonna, I mean, it's going to be awesome. I, I, I'm not going to belabor it. I just, I'm curious. Can we get the yeah, dates first? So, Do you have the dates? What happened was is, is just a lot, of, a lot of politics involved, and uh, the city was just getting so upset, and the, we were just, you know, like, well, we're just going to have to cut our losses here. It was, it was not a – decision on our end it was a decision on other people's end but um in the end we uh we we felt like it needed to happen anyway before we got completely forced out so uh it was a mutual decision on both parties but you know definitely more of a forced thing on our end but now we're looking forward to the future and uh luckily with international speedway corporation they own daytona international speedway um they also own homestead miami speedway so they put us in contact with them we are uh, able to make the move pretty smoothly, and not only are we working with them for Homestead Miami, but we're also doing a show at Darlington Speedway in South Carolina as well. Oh, oh. snap. All right. Well, wow. What, yeah. what are the dates of the two events then, and which is Homestead going to be the big one? It's hard to say. Both of these events are going to be brand new, so we got to go into it thinking like we're just going to do the best we can. Um, Good first bring year. The same yeah, bring the same business model from Daytona to those and hope for the best. You know, we're we're, we're shooting for the fences. We're hoping that the Miami one's obviously going to be a bigger one. That's going to be our summer event. That's June 10th through the 12th, which would have been the same dates as Daytona. And then Darlington's going to be our fall show. That'll be September 30th through October 2nd. I'm curious. You're way down there in Miami. I wonder how many people are going to want to drive down from all around the panhandle because before daytona you know i think a lot of people drove in from all over the southeast miami's deeper what's your gut tell you i mean are guys going to make the trek are you going to still have people flying down from canada like you did last year and years prior so far it's looking pretty good there's a ton of people coming from canada already and i've been seeing a um we actually tonight was the night that we we fully posted it up on our instagram socials and everything and uh it's so far is still going to be we've got those the Daytona loyals that are, you know, sticking with us to coming down. And there's definitely going to be those people who don't want to make that full trek. And it might weed out the people that cause the problems for us. So it's a, it's a catch 2020. Like, yeah, it's a haul, but it, it might help out getting rid of the, some of the riffraff that ruin it for everybody else. Is there such thing as a catch 2020? I there think it's a on the show. catch 22, right? No lightning. <laughs> or, or is that a combination right. of catch, uh, catch 22 and 2020 vision? Because maybe it is a catch twenty hey, lightning too, lightning, but he stop. has twenty twenty vision. Lightning, stop, stop. All right, so Jordan, legitimate question: <laughs> Is no. there? Hold on a second. No, I have a legitimate question. No, my legitimate question. No, but question, you had a horrible joke that didn't. It fly. wasn't a joke. You, you said su- catch twenty twenty. You suck at this, lightning. You suck at this. If I hadn't <laughs> called him out, our our listeners are going to be in their car going, "There's no such thing as catch twenty twenty. And you know what? Then they would be more likely to co- connect with Jordan and go to his show to tell him in person. It was a whole marketing play okay, right, right listen, there. You listen. went right through it. When I was in Daytona last time, I seen yeah. all the no, trucks. No, you did not see nothing, and there was no Cummings there either. <laughs> okay. Right, hey, Jordan. No, no, no. I'm going first. I want to talk about first. the trucks on the sand. No, not Are there yet. trucks uh, on the sand? Yet. You still got some making up to do, Sean. Are there okay. trucks on the sand? Uh, don't answer that yet. Here's the deal. Jordan, if your two favorite podcast hosts could make it out there June 10th through the 12th, would you accept them with open arms? I will. Yes. Will you help them with a hotel room? 
<laughs> you guys know you're more than welcome to come down. I'll always take care of you guys. I'm looking Both at my calendar right now. I'm actually available that weekend. No, for the first time in like not. two years. You're, you know your daughter's got some recital or no, soccer no. practice. No, her, tra- her track meet stuff uh, ends a couple weeks before that. June 10th Perfect. through 12th, you're free. In Miami. That's what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm down for yeah. a Miami trip. Interesting. I'm all down. Hey, it's only like 30 minutes from the Keys, like 30 minutes from South Beach. It's a, it's an interesting place. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, like an agricultural land. land. But uh, it's real close to the city, real close to the Keys. So you get to see some crystal clear water, some nice freedom. I know you guys would like that right now. So it's a lot of, a lot of America down there. It's a hell of a lot of America. Okay. Yeah, my kind of place. So it's not yeah. it's not the Miami that we're thinking, like Ocean Ave or whatever it is. What's that? What A one A right there? Uh, Where everyone yeah, South Beach, yeah, South Ocean Beach. Drive or something like that. Will Will do you anticipate that your crew, all the patrons to uh, Miami Truck Meet, is that what we're calling it? Miami Truck Meet or Homestead Truck Meet or Florida Truck Meet? Florida Truck Meet. Florida, Florida Truck, truck meet. meet. Okay. Right. So do you yeah. anticipate that guys are going to make the trek down to A one A and do that cruise? And then, um, and then, and then roll uh, back, or is that too far? I would imagine so. Everyone wants to stunt on like the most popular street, so I don't see why they wouldn't want to go down there. Plus, it's where all the clubs are and all that stuff too. So that'll be the uh, good nightlife scene. I just realized we failed, Jordan. How so? We didn't let him use his catchphrase before he started talking about this. Oh, well, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. It there it is. There it is. Oh man, I missed the opportunity to say, "Yeah, we got our our friend Jordan Mobauer on the phone for update." Update! 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 What is this, a battle? Update! <laughs> little, 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 little. <laughs> Come on, guys. Update. Update! Are we trying to have them hit the fast forward Dude, button? You do it. <laughs> I can't do yeah, it. Yeah, do it. <sighs> Update! That is all right. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't pretend go. to be able to do it as good as you. Update! There's, there's hope for you uh, here, Jay. There's no hope for do me. Do you think guys. we would go there and make a man out of lightning? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. All right. That what what the problem with Miami is that your wife's gonna want to go with us. My wife? Yeah. No question about that. hundred uh, percent. She's going. Wait, you're not going to That's exactly Miami right. without yeah. me because she, it's hot. <laughs> yeah. More, it's, oh no. Oh yeah. Yeah. Brandy's coming along. Yeah. Well, it's gonna be a whole family outing. No, kids are staying no, behind. No, no, <laughs> yeah, kids have to stay behind. <laughs> well, listen, I can't. No, if it's gonna be a dude trip, then it's just to be Holman and I. I'm not. You're not gonna. You take your wife, are you? You think my wife wants us to have anything to do with a bunch of Florida truckers in Miami? I, yeah, I don't know if my <laughs> wife would do it. I mean, she would go if she got to sit, sit on the beach, but we're not going or to the spa beach. or whatever. Ah, maybe. Yeah, my wife does. Here's why my wife and I work. She doesn't like any of the things that I do. Damn. Yeah, makes two of us. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, Jordan, what, what is different about this one? <laughs> what, what is different about Miami and Homestead that you didn't do or wanted to do or couldn't do at Daytona? Well, there's definitely the driving experience on the beach is gone, so that's unfortunate. But I like being uh, close to the Keys. It's a good, like, vacation, family getaway. It's a good relaxing spot to be. Um, And then the draw with, like, Homestead Miami Speedway is there's so much opportunity right there at the Speedway, and I don't have to worry about pissing off the neighbors. So I think there's going to be – there's going to be goods. There's going to be – uh, cons, pros and cons, all that good stuff. Um, it's just one of those things that remains to be seen once we get down there and actually do this event. So it's uh, well, something it's special pretty... that Holman had seen, you know, because we were both there is that mall across the street, one Daytona, um, mm-hmm. that popped off all night Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It just went off. Yeah, there yeah, has was, to be some night, yeah, there's got to be some nightlife that's nearby the event. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, or is there none? Do I have to go all the way down again to the cruise spot yeah, down by the there's beach? There's not like any clubs or any like streets like that are right next to the show. But we do have a big old parking lot out front that we're going to turn into our after hours meet and bring some vendors outside and, and try to hold some stuff there. That's bring, what I'm talking about. Plus Jordan is outsourcing. Or, uh, he's going to outsource all that craziness to Miami. Proper on <laughs> South Beach, where he's not responsible for it anymore. No, but I mean, if you, if you could, what I'm saying is, if he throws something like a proper bash in the parking lot, oh, I know, what and you're he's saying. got beer beer vendors. But, and but what like I'm that. saying is, all the riffraff that like to you know do their uh, crazy uh, freight train horns at four in the morning, driving up and down uh, Daytona streets, pissing everyone off. 
they'll be miles away in Miami proper, and uh, Jordan can mm-hmm. just kind of wash his hands of that whole deal. Hey, I made it yep. in the parking lot. We're having a party. Oh, you 50,000 people want to go cruise Ocean Boulevard uh, or Avenue? I'll catch you later. See you tomorrow on the show. <laughs> I don't think I can make Darlington, but I'm pretty sure I can make Homestead. So I okay. want to go, if uh, if our listeners are interested in attending the Florida Truck Meet at, uh, at Homestead, uh, June 10th through 12th, is the website mm-hmm. the same? How do they register? What, 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 what do they follow on social? What's all that now? Yeah, we haven't got the website up just yet, but we will on February 25th of next week. So this is uh, next Friday. So I'm assuming when this comes out, it'll be the week of. What's the website address? It is fltruckmeet.com. Well, he did the radio voice. He's been listening to you. Dot hmm. com. <laughs> am, I pu- am I pukey like that? Sorry, I just had a cookie. Um, Am I pukey like that? You can't Make be. your way over to fltruckmeet.com. That's pretty good. Let me try that. Make your way on over to fltruckmeet.com. Oh, that's pretty yeah. good. Super Friday, <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, FL Friday, Truck Friday, Meet. Friday, <laughs> Friday, Friday, <laughs> Friday, and also Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. And then for those of you FL who don't have families, Sunday, 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 Sunday. Get all your Florida truck excitement over at the Homestead Race Course the weekend of June 10th through 12th. That's right, this family-friendly adventure is full of lifted, lowered, and everything in between. Presented to you by the Truck Show Podcast. That is FLTruckMeet.com. But don't do it. All right, that's all the, the free promotion wild. we're doing for you. That's, that's it. it right there. You're gone. That, that's a that's a ten thousand dollar drop right there. Just remember that's that when nice. we ask for hotel rooms. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jordan. Uh, golf carts. So <laughs> and golf carts. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, I was I was hoping you weren't going to say it, but here no, we are. Dude, Have you seen us? We need golf carts. <laughs> we need golf carts badly. <laughs> Probably more than we need hotel rooms. <laughs> we can fly out there you. ourselves, but uh, but we we need a little hospitality on the ground. That's all I'm saying, brother. You already know, man. I am um, actually, so I'm thinking that um, like me and Pat are gonna get RVs to stay on site this time, and uh, I'm probably gonna bring down the Traeger and do some barbecuing. Wouldn't know anything about that. So you have one of those smokers on training wheels. That's really cute of you. Yeah, <laughs> a Traeger. Yeah. yeah. Oh, are you one of those? Yes, he is. Oh, hold on. Let me program mm. my smoker computer, and then uh, at, what's the ratio of pellets? Ooh, I have fa- flavored pellets here. Let me pour the flavored pellets into the computer with fire. Oh, my gosh, I have a runaway of the pellets. My smoker is now at 4,000 degrees, and I've ruined my 14-hour smoke in 15 minutes. Where, hey, where's your smoker? Charcoal, dude. Weber. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a little, <laughs> little metal Weber. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. It's a smoky mountain to you, pal. 18 inch smoked uh, up to 30 pounds of brisket at one time. Old that faithful, as I like to call it. Maybe you should bring yours over and we'll have a brisket cook off and see whose is better. I mean, I can cook brisket on a Traeger. I've done it before. How good is your meat? Okay. Oh, you've had my meat before. <laughs> That's what she Great said. A. You know, <laughs> Great Jordan, <A. laughs> Jordan, Jordan's never had my meat. Nope. That's what uh, she yeah. said. <laughs> You guys should see lightning right now. This, there's nothing in life that makes him more giddy than being able to do that same tired drop over and over yeah, again. Yeah, so tired. He just loves touching that little keyboard. That's just it makes him so happy. Mm-hmm. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jordan. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for uh, picking up the phone. I knew you had some uh, big news, but let's stay in touch before the event. I think. I think. No promises, but I think lightning and I are going to be able to uh, to make this happen and. We would be proud to come out and be part of your very first FL truck meet. Well, I'd love to have you guys, definitely for sure. I got to have my friends out there. All right. Uh, June 10th through 12th, fltruckmeet.com is the website address. Guys, get your tickets now. Uh, Reserve if you want to bring your truck down because, oh, we didn't talk about this. How many spaces are available as compared to previous years at Daytona? Is it the same size inside? You still have room for the 5,000 plus trucks inside, et cetera? It's not as comparable, but with the way we're organizing things, we should actually have more room for more trucks and about the same amount of vendors, too. And we're doing a uh, vendor boost on the outside of the track as well. So, yeah, we got a little extra space. All right. Jordan, yep. FLTruckMeet.com, June 10th through 12th, Homestead, and the other one, September 30th through August 2nd. At Darlington. Darlington, thank <laughs> and you. And that was your Darlington update! Update! <laughs> update! <laughs> there See you go. Ya. Love you. Bye, guys. Man, I feel like it has been a minute since we've done Know Your Note. This is where Holman and I uh, do our best and fail miserably at guessing your exhaust note. 
It has been probably seven or eight months. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I went back and went, oh my gosh, we have a bunch of these that we never played. Well, let's not delay. Come on now, it's time to take a trip down Speedy Lane. We're gonna play an exhaust for you, and nope, we're not insane. Well, maybe a little. Know your note. Come on and cast your vote. Know your note. Get it right, and you can gloat. Know your note. Vroom, 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 vroom. You forgot how much you love that. No, oh, this is one of my favorite ones. I love the polka. All right, so uh, I've got our uh, bevy of uh, sound files here. Okay. The first one is from Tyler Hutchins. He says, uh, Sean and Jay. <sighs> okay. Please see the attached MP3s. The first one is the engine running. It's an older clip after engine maintenance, so there's a bit of commentary on my part. The second one is the answer. I also include some facts about the engine in the text file since you and the audience may not know much about it. All Are right. you ready to know your note? Let her rip. Appears to run pretty smooth. Nothing's leaking on the ground. Ignore the uh, speedy drive. Well, I want to say it's diesel. I want to say it's diesel too, yeah. but I think it might not be. It's either diesel or it's really old. Oh, it is really old. Okay. High RPM? Yeah, but it's not very high. No, that was like probably 2100. That's diesel. It's got to be diesel. All right, so do we know your notes? Hmm. I'm going. I mean, diesel. Yeah. All right. So let's think. What what diesel truck was maybe popular in the late '60s? I'm just picking an era, randomly, because I feel like that's of the era, uh, right? Uh, military. And that feels very four cylinder ish, right? Mm. Four cylinder diesel. Uh, I don't know on this one. You ready for the answer? I feel like we're not doing a good enough job guessing. I I am I. The, the, six cylinder diesel? The, you think so? It's six cylinder? I, I don't think so. To, I, I feel like it's four. four right? Just the, the ticking of the valves. I, I, well, hmm. how would that tell you what the cylinder count is? I don't is? know. It just felt so slow and I don't, I don't know. I'm at a loss. All right. Well, here damn we go. It. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Here's the answer. Okay. What you just heard was a 230 cubic inch tornado inline six engine that you Gas. Oh wow. Gas. Gas. But I just I get I got six yeah, cylinder, you right? You did, you did in line right. six. Right. Yeah. Used to be in my nineteen sixty six Jeep J three hundred pickup. Oh man. All right. So he includes some uh, engine facts here on on the the tornado. Okay. Uh which was a very popular engine. It's just uh, it just sounds so <laughs> I, it just sounds loose. It, yeah. Like it's falling apart. No, it just sounds decently. All right, yeah. fact one. Debuting in 1962 is the first mass-produced overhead cam engine. It uniquely has one cam lobe per cylinder, activating both the intake and the exhaust valve. See, now, I, That's I told why you it sounded like slow and loose. Yeah. Right, one cam lobe. Fact chick, chick, number chick. two. Continuing with the advanced technology of the engine are uh, Hemi cross-flow head and carbonitrided crankshaft. It's not the first Hemi engine. Chrysler beat it by 10 years, but still impressive and unique nonetheless. Fact number three. Mm-hmm. Ska rules. <laughs> Barely. This says right here. Barely. Fact Ska four. does not rule. Yeah. It does rule. No. It says uh, it was utilized from mid-1962 to 1965 in civilian Jeeps and from 67. It's funny that I did say 60s, 60s right? No, I, we were in the neighborhood. Okay. We just were ro- knocking on the wrong door. Right. Says, nobody uh, was home. Nobody. Well, it wasn't even the right house. <laughs> no, no. It was a dumpster behind a business. There was, there was a guy across the street going, what? wrong house, <laughs> idiots. Yeah. Uh, and used from 67 to 69 in the M715 and 725 military trucks. The complexities of the engine ultimately gave it a bad reputation for its time, leading to its discontinuation. Yes, I know I said my truck's a 66, but there's a discrepancy between the production date and the title date. 
Fact five, the engine was continued in use in Argentina after uh, Kaiser exited the car industry and sold all of its dyes to the Argentinian government. Eventually, the Argentines upgraded the engine to have a whopping one cam lobe per valve, seven main bearings, and improved head and exhaust, resulting in a horsepower increase from 140 to 250. That's a that's massive a, that's difference. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. All right. Well, uh, now I guess my big thing is I'm, I want to apologize to Tyler for taking so long because he sent this to us last July. Well, we eventually got to <laughs> we it. We eventually got to it. Uh, Tyler, very uh, most excellent Know Your Note. And we did not know your notes. Even close. No, we were close. Oh, yeah, I guess we were. 60s and you said straight I said six. six. cylinder. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. And who's up next? All right. This one is from uh, Nathan Hendrickson. And uh, it says, hint, it's a Borla cat back exhaust. Oh, that's kind of cool. All right. Ready? Yes. Hand me 5.7 liter. Yeah. I was going to go uh, LS, but I think you're right. I think, I think uh, it's yeah. And I'm going to even guess the year. I'm going to say it's a 2016 1500 Ram with a, yeah, with a 5.7 Hemi. That's how, that's how specific uh, I'm getting. I, and I, oh, dude, I'm going to even go one step further. It's a single cab, short bed. Oh, God. All right. I'm just, <laughs> listen, I'm going to go with LS, okay. even though I think it might be a Hemi, but the, the startup sounded LS to me. I the, agree. The note didn't. But the startup did. I have a feeling you're gonna you're gonna beat me, and here's why. The, with a Borla, even did he say it's a Borla attack? I uh, just said it's a Borla. A cat Borla. Back. Okay. I think the Hemi's would be a little more gurgly and louder. I'm not gonna take back my guess. I'm gonna stick with five seven. But I have a feeling now because it's a very smooth sound, and normally Hemi's kind of have some gargle to them and a tick and a tick. <laughs> yeah, they do. So, all right, well, let's let's find out. What do we got? Do we know your notes? All right, here's the answer from Nathan. Truck is my 2001 Silverado 1500 oh, 5.3. LS, LS, LS. And Borla Catback Exhaust. Uh. My, my dad bought this truck new in January of 2001, and I took it over after he passed away of May uh, 2020. So, Nathan, sorry to hear about your dad passing. Uh, I'm... Doing a slow restoration while I drive and use this truck almost daily. Love Borla's exhaust. I ordered it in May. Just got it this week and couldn't wait to put it on. Can I get a yeah, buddy? Yes, of course you can. Yeah, buddy. A mounted parameters. Mounted monitor key engine parameters. There you go. And a blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> Still funny. That makes me uh, smile. Pretty pleased. Take care, guys. Thanks, Nathan from Knoxville, Tennessee. And Nathan, uh, love to hear about that truck now i mean we're uh, you sent this to us back in august we'd love to know how far you've gotten on your restoration and all that good stuff so uh hit us back but uh thank you for a uh, awesome know your note it's funny is on that one i was totally wrong yet right as well which part the fact that i said i was wrong and I, a, I knew so I you're was going with the fact that i'm wrong being right yes because then you could just say you're wrong on all of them no but i and said right. but, but i said uh, okay it doesn't matter what i say now <laughs> All right, uh, from our friend uh, Randall Heckathorn, he says, uh, Hey, guy, it's uh, Randall, or Rambo underscore 1776 from Instagram. Here I have a very hard know your note. At first, you're going to hear a very poppy note, but give it time and you'll hear a different note. The second is the one to pay attention to. Good luck. Okay. All right, you ready? Yeah. Dirt bike? No, it's definitely not a dirt bike. That's uh, some kind of tractor engine. Some sort of like poppy two-stroke two diesel or something? He says listen to it and it just moves out. Oh, what? wait, what was that? What was that? There two engines in one? It sounds familiar, yet... So unfamiliar at the same time. Oh, wait, what's that? Wait a minute. Is that his big Peterbilt dump truck? Doesn't Randall drive the big, uh, the Pete? I, I think so, but hold on a second. How can that be the same engine? I 
don't know. The second one, that second sound when it mellowed out, yeah. that definitely was a big a big rig engine. What do they typically have? It's, like, it's not a cat, is it? It could be a Cummins. It could be a cat. It could be International. It could be Volvo. It could be- I, I don't think it's going to be a Volvo or- No, I think it's going to be a, a cat or a Cummins. Okay. Now, why was it so clackety in the beginning? Was it running super- Berlin and cold? I don't know. We suck at this. Hey, Lightning, do we... Uh... Know your notes. My guess is no. All right, what is the Scantron answer? Remember those tests when you were a kid? You filled in the bubbles in your the test. They were the little... Uh, the label at the bottom says Scantron. You yeah, I wonder if kids do that anymore. I don't know. All right, this is a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can... Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Bulldozer. It's a 60s no, era. Wait, wait, hold on, wait, hold on, hold on. Did tractor? Did the no. first things out of my mouth was shut a tractor? Shut it. Will you shut it? I'm about to give you props. See, you can't You can't even stop long enough to get props. Take a breath. It's a 60s era Caterpillar D8K. Woo! Says uh, she served us very well. The sound you hear up first, uh, or the fire up first, is the pony motor. Then after a bit, you can hear the big motor running uh, much quieter. And thanks, and remember, everything matters. Thanks for watching, and remember, everything matters. Now, Holman, I don't know what a pony motor is. Uh, I don't either. I'm assuming, I guess, it's a smaller <laughs> motor that starts up the bigger motor would be. Isn't that weird? I mean, I'm, clearly that's what it is. I but just we have not... no reference for that. Oh, I'm going to look it up while we're looking here. Hold on. Are you a horse face pony motor? <laughs> According to Google, a pony motor is a special motor used to start a larger engine. Usually it can be All found right. in some diesel engines as they help these engines attain the proper starting temperature. Oh, hmm. well, there you go. Who knew? Yeah. Interesting. All right. And our next one is from uh, Matt Weich, uh, W-Y-C-H-E. And he says, uh, hey, guys, uh, I've never written. Seems like this is a good way to start. Love the show. Take a listen. Thanks, Matt. You ready? I'm ready. Yes. Let's do it. Smooth, diesel, chirpy uh, starter. Hmm. You think it's diesel? Yes. Oh, that's diesel. Yep. You can hear the turbo. Yeah, you hear the intake. Yeah. Smooth though. Doesn't quite sound Duramax though, does it? No, it doesn't. And it's not chunky enough to be a Cummins. But it's not a Ford. Are you it's sure? Got, yeah, no, no, I'm I'm not sure. I, I six four, six oh maybe? Oh, interesting. I didn't even think about your six fours. I'm gonna snail You're gonna snail? I'm gonna say it is a Duramax. I'm gonna go with the Duramax. I'm gonna say it's a uh, like a twenty four. To me the Duramax. starter sounded Duramax and it was smooth. But the the engine running didn't sound Duramax. But you know, Duramax is kind of have that chirpy starter. Yeah, but, uh, here's here's the problem though. I, I don't think he recorded this from the front of the truck where we heard, where we would have heard the the ticking or any of that. We heard it. Here, from let's the... listen again. Okay. Uh, yeah. Dur Duramax. It's a Duramax. Yeah, and I think it's it's be, a newer one. It's a newer one because for sure. it's because it's super quiet and that sh the starter is like really that, fast. Yeah. And it does not sound deleted. Like that sounds like you still got a DPF on there. And it so that means it's got to be eleven or newer if it has the DPF. Oh, uh, uh, was it no no oh eight when they went I DPF? Think it, I think it's newer than that. You think it's? I'm going to say it's uh like a fourteen to sixteen somewhere in there. Uh, it's I'm, an LML. So what do you think? Do we know your notes? I doubt it. But we're trying. All right, here we go. He says, uh, here's the answer. Scroll down. I didn't want to accidentally spoil it. And home in the answer, please. Duramax L5P. Oh, how did I not know that I'm surrounded by them every single Wait, freaking day at hold work? hold on. You know what's even worse for you? Oh, no, why? Oh, brand new the bank stuff on there. Brand new Banks 5-inch Monster <laughs> Exhaust 2020 GMC Sierra 3500. Uh, ordered it Monday of last week. Arrived Monday this week. They installed the goodies uh, that afternoon and wanted to do a know your note. So uh, he has a picture here of mm -hmm. uh, Gail's signature on a box wrapped in wrapping paper and a picture of the bank's tips sticking out under the back of his uh, 
L5P uh, GMC, mm-hmm. and uh, he says uh, should have uh, Lightning should know this. <laughs> that that hurts. Literally, what you do all day long. That hurt. That hurt. Well, I just didn't think that. Uh, I don't know. It's rare that we have trucks that are that new appearing on Know Your Note. So, well, are you sure? There's a first. Yeah, I don't think we've had any of uh, that late model. All right. I really don't. Mm. Well, there's a first. All right, so this one here is interesting. This is from uh, Chris Quill at Old Trucks Work. And uh, we've talked about uh, Chris before. Head over to at Old Trucks Work on Instagram. He's always got a bunch of cool stuff on there. He says, hey, guys, I got a stumper of a know your note for you. No, I don't expect you to get it right. However, I thought you might enjoy it. And the million-dollar question is, do we know your notes? Whoa. Wow. That's got some spice. Sound like an airplane firing up there for a minute. Oh, listen to it puffing and puffing. Yeah. Sounds like it's on a steam shovel or something. I, I'm going to say that is a Model T. <laughs> okay, let's hear it one more time. <laughs> yeah, do it again. Or is that like a Volkswagen thing or something? No way. No, that's a that's that's a farm implement. It just sounds like it's a like a P fifty one Mustang shooting flames out of the exhaust or something. I can't even imagine what this thing is. Uh, let's say this is a, uh, a a case tractor of some sort. Okay, I'm going to just say uh, vintage construction equipment. Okay, that's my that's my broad category. I bet you it's neither. This is going to be like some little tiny pickup. You know, I'm like micro pickup. So do we know your notes? And the answer is, it's a 1949 Mm -hmm. Oliver HG Crawler with a Hercules IXK-3 engine from the factory. It's a four-cylinder flathead engine with an updraft carb and a magneto. It's been outfitted with a Holt blade to operate as a farm bulldozer. A farm bulldozer. Look how rad this thing looks. Did it start as a, oh, wow. It looks like a little bulldog. It's a a tractor. Yeah. It's a tractor that looks like a bulldog. (laughs) Well, that's, uh, awesome. I mean, now hold on a second. Didn't we say truck? Aren't you supposed to? No, we said know no? your note. We didn't say know your truck's note. I, I mean, okay. All right. Well, in the future, guys, send us a truck note, please. I mean, that's. Or anything else that's cool. I, I yeah, You did say we that. We love to hear old stuff that we would never, ever guess. I, I, or, the or, problem is it's just too wide. There's so no. many vehicles. Even if that, we don't like, get it, that's the, us winning's not the point, Lightning. Us experiencing is. This is just a, a really awesome way to experience the auditory uh, musical notes that our listeners experience every day and share in their passion for all things mechanical. Whatever you say. All right, next one here is from uh, Richard Liggett, and he says, First off, I've been a listener from the beginning. Hopefully you got my Know Your Note. It's my dot, 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 dot. All right, all right. do we know your notes? Diesel. Yeah. Love the clackety clackety. Four cylinder. Mechanical injected. What what is it in? Really smooth, by the way. Very very steady RPM is what I mean. What's a mechanical newer four cylinder diesel? Awesome. You think that's a uh, Cummins 4BT? No, no way. No. R2.8. Oh, d- um. No, but the the injectors sound way too clackety for that. Yeah, but that that turbo was still spinning after the truck shut off. Mm-hmm. <sighs> hmm. Oh, well, I said truck. I don't know if it's truck. It may not be a truck. I hope it's a truck. <sighs> Well, this is, it, and it's not like a Volkswagen with a four cylinder diesel. Could be. Ooh. I mean, I hope Ooh. it isn't. Ooh. You think it is? 1.9. Because they put those in all sorts of different things. There's conversion companies. That, that, I like your thinking on that. Mechanical. Yeah. Four cylinder. What's the Volkswagen little mini truck? The Amarok? Is that what it was? No. Or the Rabbit? The Rabbit. The old Rabbit pickup? Yeah, I think the front wheel drive one? Yeah, I think it's a Rabbit pickup. No, it's not. No? No. Okay. I think you're on the right path, though. I think, mm. I think, I th- I'm, except, 
Uh, I want to just. I, I want to. I want to believe it's in a truck. They put it in. Yeah, but there's conversion companies. They put them in like uh, Suzuki Samurais and Sidekicks and Jeeps and all sorts of weird. Why stuff. don't we just go on a limb and say it's a Samurai? Because we're not even. We're not going to get close. Why don't we just not guess it and just say? No, we have to guess Vol- something. Yeah, it's a Volkswagen 1.9. Okay, that's my guess. Okay, so do we know your notes? And Holman with the answer. It's my 2001 Jeep XJ. <laughs> Come on. With a VW 1.9 TDI. Oh, yeah! What? <laughs> what? 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 Woo! High five. Yeah! Dang. Yeah, I never would have gotten there unless you said it wasn't in VW, and I know that you're wrong every time. So when you said it wasn't, I'm like, that's what it is. Wow. Says, okay, go says, on. Uh, Let's stop there. <laughs> he Let's says, stop there. Look forward to the show every Monday on my commute to Aspen, Colorado to do mm-hmm. high-end AV and houses with my 2010 Nissan Frontier. As always, awesome show and uh, suck slightly less. <laughs> wow. <laughs> five stars. <laughs> All right. Thanks, oh, wait, Richard Liggett. He gave us five stars. Five star review. Five stars. Thank you. All right, uh, what do you say we get into your conversation with the uh, boys over at SDI? All right, Holman, so I drove out to uh, Lake Elsinore, California, which is a little southeast of um, Orange County, California. This is a desert community out there that's uh, freaking hot, and they have a gr- disgustingly green lake that no one really goes in anymore. Uh, the one they call Lake Smell Some More. That's the one, and I, uh, I, I attempted to... Uh, water ski in I re- time. I remember back in the day when you would go there to water ski and you would say, that's funny, there's little tree branches floating in the water. Yeah. And those weren't wood. No. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> right. So freaking gross. Yeah. Anyway, Lake Elsinore, the surrounding- The town is the, much better than the, the lake itself. The town is better <laughs> than it was then. Yes, it is better. It's very, uh, uh, what do you call it when it's a- uh, uh, Quaint. Uh, it's Well, no, it's not quaint anymore. Taint. <laughs> okay, right, whatever. Right, Moving on. Enough of the town. All right, so that's where SDI is based. Now, SDI, um, Dan Worley. So what you're saying is uh, better things come out of his warehouse than come out of that lake. I would agree with that. Yes. Is it true that there is a uh, monster of Lake Elsinore? It's entirely possible. Okay, just checking. But it's in, <laughs> in, it in the trailer like, park? <laughs> it look, I was going to say it looks a lot like poo, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, why don't you uh, play your uh, clip from your adventure down to SDI? Yeah, all right, this is uh, me and Dan Worley. You're the innovator motivator. You're the innovator motivator. You're the innovator motivator. Make new stuff and it's really, really cool. Yeah, you're the innovator motivator. Step on up and tell us what you're working on. Lightning, I'm standing in, uh, I'm out in sunny Elsinore. And uh, it's like a thousand degrees, I think, in the shade. And it's in freaking February. And I'm here with Dan at SDI Suspension Direct. Is it Suspension Direct Incorporated? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, Dan, we're standing, well, we just came out of your showroom and we're standing in your parts room. I think we're one of your many parts rooms here. <laughs> yeah. No, can we're you like give, a little maze. Can you give us um, the backstory? So you are, you own the company, correct? Yeah. Okay. And we literally started off as motorcycles. Um, I worked for KYB for 10 years, and they were kind of failing on their distribution of parts. for. So you're not really familiar with the suspension industry then? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. You said KYB you for 10 what? years? It's so funny as though you're still, like every day you still learn something else, and it's like every, you, what you thought you knew five years ago now has completely changed again. It's always involving. I had KYBs on... Yeah. I think I had KYBs on my Suzuki GSXR. I want to say, okay. Yeah, no, they did those, and uh, I only did a little bit of street bike testing. Most of that was developed in Japan. Yeah. Not much was done here. My main deal was actually yeah, Honda. Probably. Did lots of development with Honda when we when they switched from Showa to KYB. So that was I actually really liked working with Honda. A lot of people didn't like it because when you work with Honda, you work. Yeah. They definitely push you, but it was a great experience. So, and so you left KYB for this, what? I actually had this on the side, and we um, we were just trying to sell KYB parts. Like a good example is a Yamaha. Your rear shock seal leaks. 
And you had to go to Yamaha. You'd buy a whole shock. It was like seven hundred dollars. You'd come to SDI. We'd sh- sell you an oil seal. It's eight ninety nine. So you can just get what you needed. And for a lot of years, like that was our main business. That's all we did. And and you were doing this simultaneously while yeah, you were KY. yeah. I did so this, this on the we, side at, a, at, at your garage like, or what. <laughs> it actually started uh, literally out of my garage in one bedroom in my house. And that's the way we had more kids. I had to boot, and we finally got our finally got our own shop, and uh, we shared it with a machine shop. And it was going to be the perfect scenario that they would machine the parts that we're coming out with because we started our own line of SDI Elite products, and then we we had like a little it was like a long closet of all the parts. And um, it, it was going to be perfect, except the machine shop we joined with couldn't get anything done. And so finally one day there was a lathe on eBay and we bought our first lathe. The guy ended his auction on Mother's Day and it was not a good day because I had nobody to compete against. So we got our first lathe for a good price and we started making parts. And now I think we have 23. Cents. And again, that was, was, that, was that lathe in your garage? No, that actually, we, that was when we moved into our first shop. Okay. And that's when we finally went for it and we bought like three CNC's to begin with. And, and uh, now, well, hold on, you just skipped ahead. You're just like the we, the we, the we. Who's the we? I had one employee at that time. We had one person, because I worked full-time, and I had one employee. So uh, that, and, geez, I did get a business partner in 2013, but it was pretty much me. And uh, we went from, once we started the machine shop, we ended up with four people. And uh, I had Matt come, and uh, one of my friends came and helped me start the machine shop and was with us for the first couple of years. And then we... um, it just kind of kept growing. We, and where was that located? Where were you? Were you out uh, here in Elsinore? Still Lake Elsinore, yeah, okay. like literally two miles. I feel I, I hear an accent coming through. <laughs> that is that Canadian. Where are you from? Yeah, Canada originally. Okay. Oh. I moved down here in. Uh, you damn commie! <laughs> <laughs> but I was just telling the story too. Ninety seven, and I just came down to ride for a month because I still was racing motocross. That was the whole dream. And then where uh, in Canada? Saskatchewan, middle of nowhere. Oh yeah, yeah, middle of nowhere. But that's, be- that's God's country up there. Yeah, it's pretty flat. There's not much. You get to the mountains in BC, it's a little bit better, but it's, it gets boring. I saved up enough, and I literally was here for an hour, and my, I had one friend that worked at Pro Circuit, and um, Bones and Mitch came up, and they like, hey, do you want a job? I'm like, man, if I have a job, like, I can stay for three months. So a year and a half later, I'm still working there. So I actually did leave there, went and raced Canadian Nationals one summer, went back to Canada, and then ever since then, I, I've been back down here. So that's actually when I got back. I got involved with the race teams. So I worked for, like, Factory Yamaha, Factory Kawasaki. And then from Kawasaki, KYB picked me up. And I went from, like, the whole racer thing more into the development stuff. You knew the product intimately because you were racing it. You were abusing it. You were breaking it. You were, you were probably contributing, giving tech knowledge to the to the R&D team, right? You're like, oh, I need to change the damping right here, or the rebound, or the compression needs to be, or this seal keeps leaking, all that stuff, right? You're giving that to them, and in the process, you're like, wait a minute, what if I just kept this knowledge to myself, right? And that's an entrepreneur was born. Well, and that was kind of funny, like, well, jumping way forward, in 2006, I asked KYB for 50 grand budget to electronic suspension, and... They weren't having it. I wasn't in the normal Japanese culture, so it just wasn't going to happen. And then that was always my dream. It started back in 2006. So with all that, there was days where we spent 13 days on a road. Because I was a test rider also. Because, you know, I mean, I raced in KYB, did engineering, did a whole bunch on human feeling, data acquisition. That was actually my main purpose there was to quantify human feeling. And then, it, but there would be days where you're on a motorcycle for like 13 days in a row and like your hands and your butt are so sore. Like the last thing you want to do is one more lap. But it was just, there was challenges at times where we're trying to, you know, we're always fighting with show. Like it was all about getting that contract and improving everything and get it good. And I guess I was lucky in a way because when I started at KYB, they were way behind Showa. And then we ended up, um, we worked hard, but we ended up getting, in my opinion, things a little bit better. And right now they're about the same. They both have their positives and negatives. So their distribution was horrible. I tried to help out with that and it worked. And we ended up starting to make our own line of parts. And one day Walker Evans, the owner of Walker Evans, asked me for a compression adjuster. So I went to KYB and to show, uh, like, hey, do you guys want to sell these? They need 3,000 compression adjusters. They need it for snowmobiles. And they wanted both high and low speed to click, as silly as that sounds. Well, nobody had it. Nobody, they all blew them off and uh, didn't want anything to do with it. So once again, I had one of those moments, like when it's the distribution, I'm like, everybody that's trying to have distributor product, nobody's doing it. I might as well do it myself. I'm like, why don't I design my own compression adjuster? And 
And I'm always like, man, 3000 a year, this is like be a great deal. So we designed a high low speed compression adjuster. I think it's in probably 95% of player snowmobiles now, OE, you know, through Walker Evans. And it's been a great partnership. And so now we literally run 24 hours a day making compression adjusters. Oh, my people. Lord. Yeah, it kind of just was crazy. But once again, evolving from that as a machine shop grow and all that, I'm like, who wants to get out and click their suspension and I'm like the future with you know Fox has been kind of leading the way with a lot of their live valve and so in 2014-15 I'm like you know what all this compression in 10 years I'm going to be out of business I'm like we got to figure out how to do stuff electronically and so we just started working on it back then and developed our own valve which is probably the hardest thing we did you said this is back in 2010? Uh, no, it was like 14-15 okay yeah so we built a proof first proof of concept just to get a vehicle kind of working and um, it was okay. It needed to go, but um, valve problems and going from like smaller shocks that were like for snowmobiles to uh, the big razor stuff, it was a huge learning curve. Building just valves on like the normal industry and all of that, they're all connected to a pump. You have constant pressure, whether it's like a thousand or five thousand, not like a shock absorber. A shock absorber is just completely random and you have spikes, you have it's rebounding, it's compression, it's all over the place. And to have a valve that holds steady and does what you need it to do, it just there's nothing really made like that. So it took us a long time to develop our valve, way harder than I thought it would be. Learned a lot. and uh, Did you have to bring in, so I'm guessing you had some guys who were experts in CAD, things like that, but you need vehicle dynamics experts. You need, there's a whole host of expertise that it didn't sound like in the beginning you had. You had to go find these people, or did you have to just learn it? No, we just pretty, the only thing that I did do is um, the software for some of the EMF, like, when we're building a complete own valve and understanding the magnetic field, the software is really expensive. So you said I said the what field? EMF, like oh EMF base, field, yeah. electromagnetic field, yeah, okay. yeah, and like so understanding where to stack things so that the pole tube has the most power. Because the whole thing with suspension is like everything needs to be small so it fits on vehicles. But then how do you get enough power? How do you make your valve strong enough to be able to hold those spikes and all those different things? So I did, and it's funny. The guy ended up telling me he d- was on the team for like Cadillac with in the 80s I guess they had one of the cars that they did development on so he actually did that work for me and uh helped me he did, made me do some tweaks to the pole tube assembly and got it so we could get the most power out of it and from there it was just designing a valve now we literally have four configurations of valves depending on if it's a 12 millimeter or 12 point uh half inch shaft or a um seven eight shaft we actually have different configurations of valves that work with those oil flow and spikes and pressures the best okay it like i said it was way more i thought it was going to be a three-month project and really it was almost a three-year project wow and at what point did you decide to go from graduate from motorcycles and the side-by-sides and then you go into the big boy stuff on-road vehicles you know so the one back motorcycles of course is my first love but like back in the day, they were selling like twenty thousand Honda four fifties. Now it's like they're saying everything's great and they're selling five thousand. Like after that, the price of bikes is so high now. It's just not like the sixteen year olds aren't jumping in and buying them. They're ten thousand, twelve thousand dollar motorcycles now. So it's never really recovered. The UTV thing has just obviously taken off and done really well. So obviously that's now a big part of our business because it was the one way to grow um the motorcycles it's like we've been doing our same thing it's been pretty level for a long time and for the amount of effort it just it was better to try to grow into the utvs and obviously that's paid off but for the electronic things for packaging and just the future all of the big vehicles are really the way it goes um you know a lot of utvs are already coming with it stock but as far as like your normal average thing a lot of people you know they're from overland like all the different things that they're doing one thing that was lacking is that versatility and suspension and like jeep is the perfect one because a jeep you have it two ways like if you buy it off the showroom th- floor on, on you know driving down the road it actually works pretty good you try to take it off road you need like a kidney belt like there it doesn't work very well let's leave it at that you, so you go you lift it and you do all of those things jack it up and it's great off road super comfortable and compliant but then you end up with you know it's pretty scary driving it down the freeway so we're finally you know you hit one button and it goes from off-road road to on road and you have a thing that feels like you're driving a sports car on the road and you hit one button and now you're loosey-goosey and you know your normal jeep setup for off-road that's really really comfortable so we're talking about the e-click system 
Okay. And is that is it called e-click for no matter what you get, whether it's on-road vehicle, a truck, or it's a side-by-side? Yeah, e-click is like the whole electronics package, okay. and that's what we named it. And, okay. Uh, Can I, I, I want to stop you here for a second because – Today, we just assume we're all so jaded, I think, about electronics. Just everything has electronics attached to it. We all have electronics on our watches. We have, it is what it is today, right? Mm-hmm. But when you're a small company, relatively small in the space, right? You're not a big OE, right? With acres and acres. Um, how many square feet do you have here, by the way? We're like 12,000 right now. So pretty good size. Yeah. For a company your size to develop an electronics package to run in harmony with an OE system, right? Full CAN bus you're updating, I'm sure, every few milliseconds, right? This is a lot of work to build a system like this that plugs in and looks at vehicle dynamics and then makes real-time adjustments. We say this on the podcast all the time, but I think like, I want people to just to really soak it in. Like There is so much R&D, thousands of man hours. Am I wrong? No. Thousands it, of man hours. We put so much more time into this than we ever thought to get to where we're at. It's funny. If the first week of COVID never happened, I don't think we would be here. Because that week, um, we kind of went from, we finally had a suspension, we had an ECU that worked, and we had soft, medium, hard. And that was what we were going to launch and come out with. Like, hey, this is like, you don't have to get out. It's kind of like locking your front axle, right? Nobody does that. It's all automatic now. So at least you could click your suspension, soft, medium, hard. And then we're, you know, there is some stuff out there like that. And I was like, you know, we should try to do it. to get the active or at least a little bit of it going and then finally covid hit where they did the shutdown so we shut down for that one week and i literally i told my kids i'm like dad's working from this time to this time clement and what was one of my main he helped uh he's one of my guys on the uh he did all the screens he actually helps a lot with the um can bus stuff and i said let's sit down and knock this out so i wrote all the main code on the dynamics and like on the ba- basically the main algorithm and he started work- working on the encoder so we could match it all and we just pounded it out in like one week i'd been thinking about it for 15 years but we finally got it so when we all of a sudden had our first uh, you had a red bull filled hackathon yeah no it was just like and we couldn't do nothing like you know literally that first week nobody knew what to do and like i talked to some other shock manufacturers and other business I'm like yeah we're gonna just shut down this week and wait to find out because it you know then it was like scale it's like what is going on the world's like coming to an end but i was like well let's just power through this like there's no really phone calls or none of the day-to-day stuff that you are involved in running business so it's like we could really just focus and get it done so that was weirdest blessing in disguise but we went and with that one week, we really got so much of the code built. Like we went from I think thirteen pages of code to forty, and then we went out and drove it, and we both just looked at each other like, "Wow, like this is already really close." So then we just kept evolving, doing things. Well, even like why we're here now, it's like um, you know sorting out things so that our systems can talk and work right. together. Oh, so so for, for those of you that are that are listening now, so I'm wearing all Banks gear right now. It's during the day, and I took off work. And what we're trying to do is, um, I'm trying to solve a problem. So I know as uh, a guy that makes electronics or sells electronics that goes into all these big trucks, Rams, Jeeps, the whole thing, we have the, our Derringer tuner and we have our i-dash data monster and i-dash super gauge. They all plug into OBD. Well, your device at SDI also plugs into OBD. And most modern vehicles, uh, their ECM will only speak to one diagnostic device at a time. And it considers your device at SDI a diagnostic device. And it considers the banks an, uh, a diagnostic device. So we can't play nice together. The consumer has to choose, do I want a tuner? Do I want to go faster? Or do I want a suspension system that talks to the vehicle? And I'm here, after we turn off this microphone, we're going to try and figure out how to have our devices seamlessly speak to one another. Um, or pass information so we can both live harmoniously on the same vehicle. And that's why I'm here and also doing truck show podcast duties. But, uh, yeah, I think that's no. the future. Yeah, absolutely. The And that's, like, actually one thing, too, we were leading in before is our system. We actually have two CAN bus. We have one that's controlling all of our stuff, and it's completely separate from the vehicles. And on the vehicle side, all we're doing is listening. We're not really affecting anything. The only one I guess that we do tap into is where we're a little bit more involved is the Ford Raptor one, just because we actually unplug their suspension ECU and replace it with ours. So that one is definitely, you know what I mean, changing um, a main component. But other than that, we're trying to have our system independent of the 
OE system, but on the other hand, we're getting all of the important information that we need from it's the piggyback, OE right? It's piggybacking, yeah. exactly. Right. But that, at the end of the day, it's never going to affect the way that your OE system works. It's just now we need to get our systems in harmony. And right. It sounds like we already made good headway. We're getting there. We're yeah, getting there. Yeah, fun. you've given our engineers a lot of great data, which they're working on. And uh, without pulling back the curtain, we're going to make this thing work. Because I've looked into SDI. I see what you guys are doing here. And we, we want to get along. We wanna, I want to promote SDI to our customers that are banks customers and hopefully you will you know it will be symbiosis you'll you'll promote you'll say hey you just bought an sdi system do you want an extra uh 57 horsepower in your jeep and they're like why what do i need to do call our buddies over at banks they speak to our system and that's a no-brainer for me so that's why we're here tell me about the raptor system i think that's going to be the one that tickles that and you know holman my my uh, co-host is a big Bill Stein fan. He's got the 8100s on okay, his yeah. on his JL. He's got a 20 JL. I think it's Sean is here's a 20 or 21. 20 JL, I think. And it's all AEV. Like soup to nuts AEV. It's beautiful with the um, the the uh, Bill Stein 8100s which he loves, but they're not active. Okay. I want to talk about what he would do theoretically if he wanted to go active. Uh, and then and talk about the the Raptor stuff because I think some people go, oh, wait pull my raptor suspension off it's all you know and go like how so tell me about that dynamic how does it how do we how are we improving on the raptor system there is actually between all those vehicles there's a few options now that we've developed um first of all raptor i totally like you went spent all this money on this truck and it comes with fox live valve shocks and at the end of the day those shocks are built not that bad i just we're not a fan of the ford algorithm the way that those shocks are controlled and it was pretty easy for us just to unplug their system and have all, our system actually run the fox shock so we oh. even sell, we didn't make a shock for the raptor we're just controlling You're controlling oh brilliant we're controlling the fox shocks and just making them work better so we t- two stages of it we have one where you just put the electronics on and for the guys that are going to be 95 percent freeway and just their normal daily driver and then they you know a little bit of off-road the electronics package is good enough for the guys that are going to be like, "Hey, I want to go to Ocotillo. I want to go hammer, you know, yeah, bomb, romp like, hard." Yeah, just they're getting after it. We actually offer service. You bring the shocks in, we revalve them and tune them to our spec, and then we actually have a different algorithm for the ones that are tuned, and then you buy that whole system, and that is like. Our little test course that we have just on the side of the lake over here, uh, the fastest we could get a Raptor through that with stock suspension is about 30. After that, it's... 30 miles an hour. 30 miles an hour. And um, it's... You could go fast. You're going to break something or you're going to be... Out of, it's hard to drive. Let's just... <laughs> it's, it's a handful. And like... With our system, the fastest I've gone with four full-grown men is, you know, 55 through there. and you Oh, my Lord. Don't even think about it. It's just, you know what I mean? It's, what, that I, truck is so capable. It's such a dumb, cool Dumb truck. it down for me. What are you doing to the algorithm? How are you manipulating it in such a way that it's soaking it up so differently? Um, well, what they're full, the revalving also helps. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, yes. it's not just, like, for that, if you want the ultimate performance, we're also tuning the shocks. Uh, basically, just different setting. I've had a hard time understanding the Ford algorithm. The more we studied it, it's just it's just different logic, not what we would use. And I just think ours is more predictive, so it's putting the shocks in the right spot for what the terrain is. Like on a Raptor mode, we have actually three different modes. We have a Baja one that you put that in. So if you're going to go in, you know what I mean, two foot whoops and want to just go across stuff, you know, that's the mode for you. We have a street mode and then we have a trail mode. Um, good example. It's like you're up at Mammoth on one of those really rocky roads that you're only going 15 miles an hour. Hit the trail mode. It softens everything up and makes it looser, kind of like a Jeep. But when you get down on a fire road that you want to, you know, push it probably too hard, hit Baja mode. It puts everything back in and it's. It's a little bit, you know, trail mode is more on vehicle attitude is the best way I can explain it. Whereas the um, Baja mode is like reacting a little bit more to driver input and trying to predict what's going to happen next. And uh, it's probably the easiest way to explain it. Interesting. A lot how, of- how does it predict based on the last compression and rebound? Like, how does it know? How yeah. can it know? It's not tied into it's, GPS or, you know, it's not seeing the landscape. You know, though, we're getting data. Um, we're getting IMU data, first of all. 
I don't so, know what that is. No, um, basically a gyro and accelerometer. Okay. So number one, we're looking overall picture of the vehicle, and then we're getting input like vehicle speed. You know, vehicle speed is just a huge one. It's d- basically dictating what frequency you're going to be hitting these bumps. And when you know what speed you are, and then you look at the Z acceleration of a vehicle, you know, what I mean, you can start calculating these things and being more predictive. And then you have things just like um, driver input, like if all of a sudden you completely floor the gas pedal. Well, that means you're getting after it, right? And, you know, we can stiffen up the rear. We can counter it. Same with braking. If you're light on the brake, you don't really need it. But if all of a sudden you slam on your brakes, the best thing to do is to, um, you know, stiffen up the front. So a lot of that, you know, we can look at those driver inputs and they have it. Same with, like, um, a quick initial yaw moment or something. Um, it, our algorithm bumps all of those up so it's more reactive. It's probably the easiest way to explain it. Okay. Uh, and you had to make for your complete systems you are supplying everything in some cases for example the coil the shock body the perches the uh, everything including the electronics the harnesses everything all in correct so like Raptor comes with what we call our electronics hardware package. Of course, the software and everything's in it. And if somebody goes and um, wants a retrofit an older Raptor with the Fox Shocks, we sell a coil kit also. So you just put the coil on, we have a cap, and you're done. But then for like our Jeep systems or like the new one that Carly's getting just released uh, that we co- co-developed with them, uh, you know, it's a complete shock package. It's every single thing you need. It's complete shock absorbers, the mounts, the um, mounts all the wiring, you know, everything that you need to put it together. And that's also, you know, I mean, the ECU for the suspension, the touchscreen encoder, the IMU, which is the inertia sensor. Um, You know, I mean, it's the whole complete package. Mm -hmm. What does IMU stand for? Inertia measurement unit. I'm glad I asked. I know. It's (laughs) like one thing, we have a pro menu, so you can actually get in and really, really fine-tune all every aspect, like your turn sensitivity, like, how much is the algorithm really going to affect it? Like, that was one of the big things that we're most proud of. But at the end of the day, people don't want to. They want to pick their train and go drive. And, like, that is the beauty of our system. And we actually kind of even change our message even a little bit with that. Is like the modes are really the key feature. Yes, we're proud of our pro menu. And for, like, the racer or somebody that really wants to fine-tune every aspect, like, now it's like one of your systems. Now you have a power commander or whatever you want to call it for a the pedal monster pedal monster for right. for your suspension and you can tune how much do you want it to work but we also now have modes depending on and, and you're right so on the pedal monster which is our newly uh released throttle booster it's doing really well uh hopefully we'll hook one up to your your trucks here uh, we have 30 levels of sensitivity but really you can go to like city there's 10 levels of city sport 10 levels of sport and then track 10 levels of track most people just go city sport or track and they choose one and they leave it there forever yeah. you know and you're saying the same thing it's just people want ease of use yeah right exactly no and that's so with most of our algorithms people don't touch any of it and then but like you said you have those levels so if somebody says hey in Baja mode I really like a couple of clicks stiffer on the back because maybe they put more weight in the back or whatever you know they have a tire rack with two spares so they'll click it up but then every time they go back to Baja mode it's at that setting and then chill mode they make, maybe they just really wanted it you know extra soft so they just turned it all the way down every time you go back to chill mode it's that same aspect same just how the uh, gotcha. pedal monster works same deal okay Tell me how many applications you have for trucks and Jeeps at the moment with uh, this eClick system. Jeep right now is all the, like, JL, JK, JT. Uh, Ford Raptor system and uh, Gen 3 is getting worked on. The um, F-250 is done. And we're getting ready to launch two more trucks here shortly. We'll let you know. We're still... Oh, we can't talk about it we yet. We can't talk about it yet, but... Can we talk about the stuff you're developing with that other company that starts with a C and ends with an I and has an R in the middle? Uh, yeah, no, that's... Uh, Carly? Yeah, no, Carly's is out, and actually we're getting ready to ship their first order this week. Congratulations. So, yeah, no, man, that partnership worked out, like, so well. Say just, like, Dan, all those guys. Well, they're also a block away from us, and, you know, so we've been actually doing some machine work with them and helping them out, and it's just, he drove our Jeep, and he's like, I need this for our... The, the, for the Ram and the F-250. And at the time, it was just easier to start in the F-250. Because Carly are king, guys. 
well, until maybe now. The uh, I, you know what I mean. They're still selling a lot of the, the, that system, but what they did, they did such a good job. So we did a couple of their trucks, and they went and took it to all their. They got such a good dealer network, and they took that truck and got all those guys in that truck. And then the pre-orders and the excitement behind it was just it amazed all of us. Um, I still never driven in a stock F two fifty. Like I want to do it because I've driven. You can yeah. borrow ours. We have a twenty nineteen. Take it wherever you want. And it's just the response that we've gotten on that truck and how much better it ended up being. Um, and it was cool because the, actually the valve shim stack in it, Sage did that because Sage is like really involved. Like every single aspect of his kits is like he is a perfectionist and he wants it his way. So actually, the main valve setting is a Carly setting. And then we went and got it back, and we're like, "Yeah, this is good." I said, "Give me two, give me a couple hours," and we went out and tuned it electronically. And it dropped his truck back off. Go try that. And then he's just like, "I can't believe you did that electronically." So he took it out two weeks. I know he like actually took some time off finally, and he went like hunting. It's like he's like, "Hey, can you do this, this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, hold on a second. And so now we can just tune so fast electronically. You just need. A decent base setting, and then the rest of it, you know, we get on a computer. I'm tired of getting oil on my hands. It's yeah. so nice to plug in a laptop and just, you know what I mean, change change a few settings. And That's the future. Nice. That's the future. So is the eClick system, let's talk through the eClick. What am I getting with the eClick? You, you talked about I'm getting the full the full system. Is it controlled by uh, Bluetooth on my on my phone, or or is it? You know uh, what? We didn't go down that road. I know. Is it the little screen yeah. on the, oh, so this display out here. So it, think of a Nest um, uh, thermostat on your wall, right? You guys have seen those commercials for a Nest. This one looks like a little miniature. Is that fair to say? A Nest controller? You know what? It is so it's, close to that. And I didn't even realize it. I was eating at a restaurant and I looked up and I'm like, that looks like our controller. I'm like, oh, that's a Nest because I had never really seen one up those. It's very close. It's slightly smaller than a Nest, uh, but works the same way. Touch screen. What's kind of cool though is you can click the outside like you're clicking your shock. It's literally got a dial. So when you get into some of these menus, like let's say you wanted to make your um oh yeah, sorry, so what we're looking don't... at guys if you haven't seen a nest screen this is about to what is it, like two and a quarter wide two and a half inch wide yeah uh, it's about two and a half inches okay and the outer ring goes around just like a volume control and it has detents so yep. i feel a like very but it's damped it's not sloppy this is very positive i feel um detents as i rotate it's it it's kind of like clicking your shock absorber. it is it's you like feel you had you know the yeah the rebound detents. and compression okay and then so, inside is a, a really high res screen and it's also, oh, it's a touch screen as well? Yeah, so it's touch screen, but what you can do when you go to change your settings, it's basically like a clicker. But now instead of getting out, so if you do want to fine tune it, not let the act, like you want to fine tune the active part of it, mm-hmm. it's like the front, you can make it stiffer. This is obviously a display, and the whole purpose of this is, you know what I mean? So you can actually push. Have you tried it yet? No, I haven't. Go so ahead, what, you guys have seen these things where it's got a, uh, it's got a motorcycle grip, a hand grip on this lever and it's connected to a vertical um, shock um, with a remote reservoir and then it's got it looks like this would have been a, 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 some type of adjustment over here at one point that's on that's the, actually you, the I know is it the fill this is the actual um, uh, the solenoid this oh is that's the, the solenoid okay yeah, the wires are going in I know the cap we've had more and more people we built this cap it's a special tool to hold it on they go oh it looks like a clicker and I'm like obviously we've designed too many compression adjustments because right, yeah. we make everything look like, <laughs> like a, clicker a clicker handle you like make, we should have done make, something different you do, do something else but anyway also on this display I see your your uh, your control module over here yeah. right and that's a cast aluminum box into a uh, a big harness that goes into this box but down below you've got again this this uh, forgive me for saying again this net like circular dial. Yeah. All right, and then I'm going to pull. So, what do you want me to do here? I'm yeah, gonna, go ahead. I'm gonna, Give I'm it a pull. tug on this motorcycle uh, grip and pull down and compress the shock. Which, oh my God, I could, I can't get it down. It's really, really slow. And we actually cheated this. This isn't even full stiff. Oh my but God. Okay, we were so getting this is like bodybuilders that go and um, all, right, all my weight. I weigh two twelve, and I can barely compress this okay i'm gonna let it up so we were getting big bodybuilder guys that would come and we had it i don't know said it like it was gonna 350 at three inches per second okay and they're bending our displays because these guys are so massive and strong they're literally bending so the, the shock so we not compress they're bending it trying to bend the shock okay yeah. they're breaking stuff okay. so now here i'm just this is actually a quick switch on the display go ahead and give this a try okay so he just set it to soft right Oh my lord! Right down, no problem. Yeah, right down. So then this, it, the way that it updates. 
Uh, oh, so this you know is I mean? so this, this is a, this switch is a little bypass for the control. I, just I understand. So that it's easy for yeah. yeah. So what what, what he's doing? There's two ways of switching this this command center right here. He's got this display like you'd see at SEMA or you know Off Road Expo something like that. So anyone can come up and pull the lever like a game. Um, he's got a quick selection, soft or firm on the left, just a toggle switch. But then he's got his control on the right again, that Nest looking thing, and you you're swiping up and down just like you would with your Apple Watch. It you're, you're swiping it, across it, it, the face. And this is actually the home button. So it's, it's got like an Apple home button. Okay. So if you ever need to go back to the main screen, you just hit home and it okay. takes you there. And then you can go through all the menus. Some cool features too that um, you can pick. Uh, we need to change the time. So, so many people play with this. The settings get so jacked up. Like um, rear load. So if you're heavy... You go and you crank. Like if we're going to – sometimes we'll tow our Razor with our Jeep on the trailer. You just crank the rear load to 100% because normally like on a Jeep, it feels like you're going to do wheelies if you put that much weight in the back, right? Because the springs are always soft. So you just crank up the rear load and it handles. Like we'll drive the Jeep to uh, Moab with this and not even think about it. I remember with E-Click, the first round that we ever had, it was just soft, medium, hard. And that Jeep, we put it on a trailer and we tow it to Moab. Ever since we've done active – we drive our Jeep to Moab for all the shows. It's funny how you say Moab. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone say we're all white. We're like Moab, and here's Moab. It sounds very elegant the way you say it, Moab. <laughs> so, but to all the shows, it's just just drive the Jeep because on the freeway it handles like a car. And then you go, you hit one button, and you're on the trails. This is amazing. It's so easy. I mean, I'm just turning. It's like a volume dial, right? A, a volume control. Yep. I'm just selecting up. It's from there's a um, a negative and a positive, and a, what is that? A barbell type thing. Looking yeah, in the middle, it says our, rear load it's, as if it's weight. There's right? so many discussions that went into what logo for what vehicle, right? And like to make it look right. We had to for Carly's. We're trying to use a Raptor logo because a Raptor truck does look different. And they're like. We finally just went and switched it and made we made a logo for the F-250. But a few other things, like even your output, like what you see, your screensaver, you can have it to where the shock is. You can have it where your vehicle speed is. This actually gives you the tilt angle of the vehicle. So oh, there's no not kidding. A, there's actually not an IMU on this. Uh, there's not a sensor on this display. Sure. So it's always We're standing in his showroom, guys, so cut us some slack. <laughs> and then uh, vehicle speed. So another cool feature that we built in, if you didn't reflash your stock ECU and you're on a Jeep and stock is 33-inch tires, you put your stock wheel tire size into our unit. You just – here, I can show you. Mm-hmm. You just um, go and uh, hit the screen, put your stock size in, put what size of tire you have now. It'll calculate the difference and give you the true speed. And it gives you your true vehicle speed. Right. So all you do, like stock is 35 and then um, just swipe it across. Oh, your current tire, what, you know, you just basically go the dial and it gives you corrected vehicle speed. So when you're driving, your screen's right there. You always have, you know exactly what speed you're going. And Brilliant. then we did this too because if you're going from 30, like, a, you know, some of the Jeep guys, they're going from 33s or even like if they bought a basic, so I think some of those are like a 31 inch tire almost. And then they're putting 40s on it. Well, it's so out of whack. And so if they didn't flash their ECU and, I'm, you know. They have no idea, right? They're, yeah, the, the highway vehicles. patrol is pulling up behind them. Well, and then our algorithm to make the shocks work right is completely off because the vehicle speed is so far off. So for our information to make sure that our ECU is receiving good, that's why we added that. It was just a benefit. We tried to cover all of the little things, but at the end of the day, it's just pick what type of train you're on from the main mode menu and it's going to do the rest for you. It's like you don't need to think about getting out and clicking your suspension. This is an Apple Watch. It's about an, an extra three-quarters of an inch bigger than an Apple Watch, but is it is every bit as elegant. You did all of the design and firmware software in-house for this? For Yeah, we did everything inside. So actually, I'm gonna, I have one engineer, and he took over this screen, and he's done things with this. I... I handed it off to him because he was all interested in it. I was going to do it myself. And the next thing I know, he's done things with this screen that the company that sells it to us didn't know it could do. Like changing the brightness. Um, we, You have a brightness thing. So if it's So night, many nits. Yeah, it's just all of those things. And we have it all programmed in there. So you can really fine tune it the way you want it. Uh, it worked out great. But no, we had to... like. It's, what we have to do is combine so many different companies' parts to make one whole system. And like, 
I think that's probably one of the biggest hurdles for suspension companies and why not a lot of them have complete systems like that right. because the development of it, it's just... It's like every aspect of engineering you possibly think of. Like you need to write code, which I was lucky. I, it's one of those weird things. I was, I just figured out. I'm just away from that. Oh yeah. Just um, sorry. The I, I always kind of knew how to write code, and that wasn't great. But if I have a good sample to go off of, we could make it work. But to get the algorithm to figure out how to make it work in the shock, to understand the dynamics of the shock and what is going on in there. It's just, there's so many different aspects that you all have to make sync. And it just, it's a lot of development. And you know what I mean? There's a lot of engineers that are great at fluid dynamics, but when it comes to electronics and trying to write an algorithm or, you know, that's one whole thing, but then to understand vehicle dynamics to make sure your code is doing what the shock needs and to combine all of those, it's not an easy thing. And I think almost bigger companies have a disadvantage because they'll have a separate group that does each aspect. Where with us, it's like pretty tight and, you know, we talk every day and we're driving, we test together. Um, you know, I mean, different. We, we, so many times we'll go and test and then we'll just grab a different set of, you know, some of the other guys like our shock service guy or grab two other employees. Hey, let's go. We're going to go test this. And we have a few test courses that are close by just to get more opinions and get everybody involved. Okay. So we see the finished product. Do you mind if we go through a tour and uh, check out how it's made? So um, I guess this is the first part here. This is basically our shipping. We have, it's like a little assembly line. So all of our common parts, uh, none of the overstock, but people, guys can just grab stuff out of the bins put in a box there's literally a window on the other side and we just ship that out which is a lot of like our motorcycle our utv parts like our our normal sdi product line but in the back actually our day shift just closed out. a lot of very pretty anodized parts here i'm seeing a lot of anodized okay uh, now i'm seeing i'm seeing uh these aren't cnc machines these are long lathes what am i looking at these are actually screw machines what? So yeah, they're full CNC. So like all four of these are eight axis um, screw machines. So they uh, like you're making screws. Yeah, like this right here is. Uh, I gotta be careful what I say on this one, but um, this is a little pin. Can you guess what that thing's for? Well, that looks like a set screw because it's the top uh, uh, an yes. Allen. Yeah, and the top's an Allen. That looks like a what is that a three like a two mil Allen. And the, I can't even describe this. The, the top is threaded and the bottom... It's just basically a rounded... It's rounded. That's I'll a, just give you a clue. It's yeah, a okay. safety pin for something. A safety pin? This is... Uh, the whole thing's only half an inch long and it's very small. Probably two and a half mils wide. Um, I don't know. A safety pin for what? <laughs> Wait, you can't leave me on? <laughs> um, the... Oh, he is. He's just going to leave I me high and dry. This is a compression adjuster part. So you can see, like, we can do all of these flats... It's fully automated. A complete finished part always comes out with these screw machines. It's, like, so nice. And, you know, that part on a normal lathe, I think it used to take us, like, two and a half minutes. And on here, I don't know, what is our cycle time? I'll tell you. I won't even lie. How many custom fasteners do you make? Wow. Um, and why do you have to use custom? Or could it be some, could you just buy something off the shelf from McMaster Car? You know, there is, like, actually a lot of that. Like, common fasteners, the methods that they use to make those because the volumes are so high, it is cheaper to, like, go through a McMaster car. But, like, on something like that, that's, like, a more of a... It's a custom part for a customer. That's actually not ours. And, you know, for all of that, that's where these machines um, really shine. Uh, I used to say you need to make a 1,000 parts, but really, like, these... you To set them up and get them running right, you really want to make probably 5,000 parts at a time, where... Like a half inch nut is a whole different process. You know what I mean? It's that's just getting stamped and they're making millions of those at a time. So that's where McMaster car actually does come in really, really well. But like on a screw machine, this thing's a 54 second part because you are working on the front side, the back side, everything at the same time. Actually, we walk over to the lathe side. We have a couple of our bigger screw machines. So this building, this section here with these CNC machines, this was born out of necessity, correct? Yeah, like just to make our own products and uh, the volumes on some products got so high that we had to figure out ways to make parts faster. Even we run those, like we're in the middle of a shift change right now, but these machines run almost 24 hours a day just so we can keep up with demand on some of the parts. And then we do some fill jobs in between. 
Um, a good example is this machine here is actually, uh, it's 10 axis, but it's a three path machine. This is one of our weak link parts. A lot of our parts are taking under a minute where this one here was taking us two minutes on a normal screw machine. So on the Miano that we just got, it's literally three path. So three tools are cutting this part at one time. Oh my Lord, I don't even know how to describe it. This looks like a, uh, a female air fitting, which I know it's not. I don't, what, what it, is it? This is actually a housing for compression adjuster. Okay. But you know what I mean? It, with these machines, we can do the flat, like it's a finished part. It literally comes out of the conveyor, it's done. We wipe the oil off of it, but all the features in it, like all the side holes are done, everything on the inside, it just completely automates this, this it. This has interior threads, exterior threads. It has holes vertically, horizontally. It has a rib, like a, where a, a some type of a, a keyed fitting would go. I, I can't, there's so much going on in this one yeah. fitting. There's so, so many machine operations in this one fitting. I can't even believe that. So they, yeah, no, and like these parts get so complicated. That's where these machines sign. Our uh, our Star Thirty Eight is it literally is an eleven axis machine. So on the front side of it, uh, it's weird. So you're always hearing about a five axis machine. I've never heard of an eleven axis machine. So what it is on the front side of it, it is it's a five axis mill. Just but it turns into a lane. It's going to be a lathe or a mill. When it's in mill mode, it actually has the capabilities of being a five-axis mill. And then on the back side of the machine, it's either like a four-axis um, lathe or mill. Uh, so like this part here, we do this complete on here. This is actually a valve for our E-click uh, suspension. This is the main valve. But you can see, like, you know what I mean? All these holes are off-center. They're at weird angles. And this is oh. aluminum or is that stainless? What is this? This is actually aluminum. This this body here is an aluminum one. Uh, we use it in a few different vehicles. It just gets hard anodized, and it has to go through a few processes for finishing. But this is all, you know, as far as machining goes, this is a finished part. So you can hear it right now, that noise right there, it's it's switched from basically a lathe and turned into a mill. So it's doing milling features. So that's a nice thing. Like when we first started, we had lathes, then you take it off the lathe and then you put it on a mill. And then we got fourth axes on the mill so we could spin the part and drill the hole. Now everything's done on the machine. We can actually walk over here. Uh, once we started having to build our own shock bodies, we had to put in more cells of bigger lathes. And just to keep up with like our own product demand, some customers that we do things for, like I said, we have a great relationship with Walker Evans, so we do things with them. And once again, what always ends up hurting is um, that's a top bushing for a suspension package for one of our customers. So I couldn't help myself. I had to just touch it like a kid in a candy yeah. store. No. So um, it's uh, part of one of their kits. And uh, so we do a lot of things like that. And like all of these, this is normally what we do bodies on this. This lathe here actually, so they're live tools. So we can do all of our side holes. So when we're making our shock bodies, it's not like it's going on a machine five times. Like everything gets done at once. I'm really big on making parts in one operation. The more you touch it, the more refixturing is just the more chances you have mistakes. So we purposely bought this machine. It's literally got a four inch hole through. So we can bar feed uh, four inch stock. Like it's just a big old monster. This is a 15 foot long Hyundai Motor Group mill. What is this? This is an HD 3100M for you guys actually, at home. So it, this is a live tool lathe. So it's either, well, there is a button. I don't know where it is on this one. I could find it here. But you basically select these lathes now. It's either it's a mill or it's a lathe. And um, you have the capability of doing both now. And so the spindle can either spin and turn like a lathe or it stops. And the live tooling on the turret, then you can live tool and you can make all of those weird shapes. So it, it's just a future because the more you, you just have to keep this stuff automated. And when parts come off the machine, just finished, your control is so much better. And to, you know, for us to compete with China and everybody else, it's the only way to do it. You have to be, I guess you just have to machine parts smarter. And with some of these machines, it's like, it helps take out the labor because the machine's doing so much work. Of course, we still need our guys to watch it and do what they're doing. But instead of refixturing, reloading, and, all, you know, it, people touching the part a whole bunch of times, everything's a lot more automated.
By the way, he's got a, a Kawasaki KX. Is that a 250 or 125 hanging from the ceiling? A yeah. 250 hanging so from the ceiling. I worked for Roncada when we were at Factory Cowie, and uh, it's actually my business partner's old bike. But when they switched from model year 02 to 03, we're throwing all the parts in the garbage. So I basically kept enough parts to build a factory replica <laughs> bike. And we just hung it from the ceiling to do it. something keeping, different. Keeping it real. So this was our original shock room that we did all of our shocks and R&D and everything. Now it's just a dedicated R&D room, even though it's on the side of the machine shop. It's a clean room. But we have a Roeg Emma Dino. There you go. Another three-letter word. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again slower. A what? Roeg Emma. Okay, so Roeg is the, is the brand name. And, and uh, Emma. Uh, electric Magnetic Actuators. So instead of like, you know, there's crank dynos, there's hydraulic dynos. This is literally rare earth magnets. And then there's motors with a bunch of coils on it. And it basically is just magnets pushing against electricity to move the dyno. So what we can do, you can do any waveform you want. We can load track data, put it on the dyno, and it'll replay what you recorded from the track. So all of our R&D is done on this dyno. We have a rotary dyno, like a crank dyno, in our production room. We'll get over there in a second. So all of we've had this thing forever. Um, it's such a key tool in development. Well, it's no different than your dyno. It's how do you figure out a turbo and tune everything. The easiest way is to first put it on a dyno and get all the kinks out. So for all of our development, all of our shocks, and even when we're baseline things, everything gets dyno cataloged and we're always using it as a tool it it isn't the end all and it's not perfect you know i'm sure you guys find but, that it, but it gets you eight tenths of the way there right exactly it, it instead of guessing you know exactly where you're at and you're what it, it just makes it so much faster for development and then at the end of the day it's those final touches and i'm sure you guys run into the same thing with you know i mean when you guys are building a turbo for something it's like you're dyno and dyno and dyno and you get on the road and even though one might not look the best on the dyno it you know user perception and the way it feels like no this is the setting this is what we want it always seems to happen that way it's exactly how it goes down so another quick the next we do have a lot of little rooms here it's funny uh this is our programming oh there's like a secret door i didn't even see this opening it's got a bunch of files we hanging on boss in here so we better know okay shh. in trouble okay we'll talk uh, quietly QC, this is basically the expensive tools are in here. Our programming, like how we send programs to the machine. Alyssa helps me run the shop. I see microscopes in here. <laughs> yeah. What are you using microscopes for? Do you have parts that small? No, I'm just blind. <laughs> uh, for certain features, but uh, even like the, we have a surface roughness tester. There's like, that, that right there is an optical comparator. And it's what, that's a 24 inch display. Just easier because the screw machine parts are so, a lot of them are small, but then to really look at a thread or a feature to make sure like your radius, your chamfer is right. Uh, a good example, on our electronic valves, we're holding two tenths tolerance. And two tenths cost me three months of development time because we had a taper in something that couldn't be there. And it was like a hard lesson learned. So our inspection equipment, it's just with some of these tight, tight tolerances, uh, you have to do it. So if you had not told me, I would think that I was in an optometrist's office. <laughs> I'm not joking. This machine right here looks like something, it's a jumbo version of something that I would look at a human eye through. Um, or, again, There's all of these... CMM, so we can just probe and... I don't know what that stands for. Um, coordinate measuring machine. Oh, it's the one that touches it. It, 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 it yeah, touches all over the object. Probe, okay. And then it comes out on the screen and it just tells you the points. Okay. Gotcha. So you, we sometimes use it for reverse engineering or there's just certain jobs that are very hard to um, check with normal tools like hand tools. So what we can do is we can write a program on here and it just tells the guys where to touch it. We have some like big, long kind of radius tight parts and we have to make sure that the circle of that is correct because it fits over a ball and so what we do is we just touch it off with a probe and it literally gives us a reading of how good of a circle we're cutting gotcha. and then it i saw something like this at willwood uh, the brake manufacturer oh yeah and, I'm sure they they had, and they were doing a lot of reverse engineering as well they would get stock like oe parts and then they design their their calipers their brackets around the oe parts using a similar device it's funny because a lot of it's gone to lasers now and you can like literally 3d laser scan something and for like all the weird shapes it's fine and we've done that but then when it comes to critical like super the transmission the case, tolerances right yeah it's like you know even with the laser you're still 
that's subjective on how you're picking things. So what we'll do is we'll get that scan, but then like we were looking at a transmission case a while ago and we needed all the bearing pockets, we use a CMM. Because then those relations to what they are, you can draw that and have that perfect. So that and the rest of the case you design around the 3D scan. Gotcha. It's a little bit... Uh, yeah, so this machine just looks like an X and a Y and a Z. And it, and it comes down automatically and touches, literally just touches the part. And it does it hundreds of times and, and maps it in space. Yeah. Right? That's it, all it's doing. It, it detects when it's touching it ever so slightly. It gives you points. And you can actually... It depends on what type of program you're running, but you can go and define, like a line, you only really need two points, right? Um, on some of the spheres, we actually go to seven, so we can get a better number to make sure things are going. So it's all just depending on what type of feature you're looking at or what are you trying to do. Because you can get a circle, technically, with three points, and it'll calculate it. It's just how accurate do you want to be. If you had to guess, how many total machines do you have? I think we're at 23 right now Okay, for CNC stuff. And, and you started off with one. Yeah. In a garage. One lathe, and then we ended up pretty quick at three, and we had three for a while, then it went to four, and then we realized it still isn't enough, and then it was eight, and then it was like, it's like it seems like it just kept doubling. So, what is your single most popular part? Man, I don't know. Cody, what is our most single popular part? What do you think we sell more of than anything else? Clutch alignment tool. Really? Yeah. A clutch alignment tool. I was so close to quit making it, too, because it's a pain to make, and it didn't sell for how many months? Like eight uh, months? Six months. Six months. Six months, and then forums got it, and then Hunterworks got it and started doing videos on it, and it just, we couldn't keep them in stock. Wait, uh, is it for, for, for what vehicle? Polaris Razors to align the clutch. And you can go through belts, just left and right, if you just use that tool. Well, I was racing them, and I got so sick of building belts. And one of my buddies that works for Players, he was a snowmobile guy, which they've been doing clutching forever. And he's, like, explaining how they did it on a snowmobile, which is a different setup because the chassis flex so much. And I'm like, well, a Razor, these aren't, like, it's all tied together. So we literally made this clutch alignment tool. I started using it on my race car, and it worked. So I was like, well, let's make more of them. And I was like this close to being like we're done with it and all of a sudden they just started selling like crazy we have two lathes that almost just make it full time to keep up it's yeah it was like one of those surprises that you just don't expect that's cool and it's like kind of cool what does it cost which retail? Because of all the different transmissions like as Polaris has gone through different oh there's not just one anymore there's yeah there's what Six different transmission, uh, five, five different transmission shafts, two engine, and the main bars have been the same. Yeah, but if for your one overall vehicle, what two fifty nine? Yeah, it's right there okay. for the whole retail set. But we had some people. It was funny because the forms really helped us a lot. Like, man, that's so expensive for a tool. But like, we're grinding. Like the shafts, everything is perfect. Like we, instead of trying to just cut it on lathes, we send it out to grind. Like. Everything is within, it's less than a thousand. How dollars. much heartache is it saving you for 259 bucks? Well, know? the belt's $200. So how many belts do you want to go through? And our, like our friend's fusion across the road. I wasn't going to make one for the turbo because the way the motor and everything mounts, I figured you didn't need it. And we literally had people in forums like mad at us for not making it. So we would go on, a whole bunch of us, we'd always go on these big group rides. And our kids, he's blowing up two belts a day. And I'm like, this is so ridiculous. So finally, I'm like, he had his car apart. Uh, we measured everything, just set up a lathe quick, made one, made it work. He was then going through belts like once every five trips. Okay. And he was, we were doing two a day because it was so misaligned. And you can only move, they have an aluminum case that actually holds the transmission and the engine together. And you think, I'm like, there's not enough play to make that big of a difference. Well, there was enough because it went, especially he put bigger wheels and all of those on, so it stresses the belt that much more, but it made that big of a difference. So it was like the turbo one just took off also. So then this is now our production room where we're putting uh, the E-Click shocks together. This is actually the Carly F250 rears right here. And again, you're milling the shock bodies as well, correct? Everything. Like... Trying to like we don't make the rubber parts and we don't make these bearings. Mm -hmm. The Schrader valve, even like that we put nitrogen, that's made on a screw machine. 
Oh my lord! It's like so, you're making that. Yeah, no, yeah, we make thousands of those. Uh, it's um, that's it's a one beautiful of piece of hardware. Because of the technology, everything is so high end. So on the shock itself, we didn't cut any corners. Like it's seventeen four shock shafts. Even our bushings are like three hundred three stainless. Everything was like high end, the best that we could do. In the beginning, we weren't even supposed to make the shocks. Walker was, but Walker is like so busy they can't keep up with all mainly their polaris orders Mm -hmm. and so it just kept getting drug on and finally when i was i was like you know what we just got to make these ourselves and it gave me a chance like everything that i've learned over the last 20 years about shocks is like no okay this is our first complete shock so everything i liked about something you know i mean learning from all these other companies so i've taken ideas from other companies you know what i mean just you were not going to make any concessions Right. I mean, it was going to be first rate. Oh, no, I like I, it's, I, it's your name out there as well. Well, so you I mean, go I mean, if, you, you, if you chinced on one thing, everyone's going to call you out on it. Exactly. So I was like, I'm going to make this thing like what I believe in is the absolute best. Every aspect was that way. You know, one guy might one day he has like a two and a half inch on his Rubicon. And then the, who knows, like later on, he's like, I want to go to 40s. I want we have three C clip positions. You let out the nitrogen. You have an inch and a half range on the length of your shocks. So now that guy doesn't have to go and buy new shocks. He can just modify these and it works on his next setup. Mm. So we try to do things like that. And like our free piston, so many of the other shock manufacturers, it creates so much friction. And so it's like some, well, we kind of already were. Well, what do you mean? Explain. Oh, so the free piston is like what the what separates the oil from the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And so obviously they have an O-ring on it and a seal, and a lot of them have bushings. So the design that we did was, it's complete different. Let's go and find the cutaway shock. I think it's right out here. Because once you see it, it'll make so much more sense. Colby, oh, here it is right here. All right, so So, we've got a cutaway of a shock. So basically, this is our free piston, and there's not even a bushing on here. So almost the whole thing is always floating in oil. So this is your your remote canister right here, okay? You're calling this the free piston, and this is a piece of what, Delrin or something? It's not Delrin, it's a proprietary plastic of another, it's a plastic manufacturer's proprietary blend, so it's better for high heat. Um, Mechanical properties are actually very close to Delrin, like Delrin's a great plastic. It's just got a little bit better uh, heat properties than what Delrin has. Okay. Uh, and you're saying this is just floating freely, just like I'm moving it with my finger right now. You know There's what, no spring, nothing in here. There's nothing in there. You know, the nitrogen is puts pushing on the oil, but mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you can just feel how smooth that thing is. It, and it, normally, you know, I mean, most manufacturers use a, a bushing to hold it in. And with this design and the mass being so light, um, a lot of times, like when you're pushing on a heavy piece of aluminum, you have to move that. You have to move that mass and that, you know, it... You end up feeling it in a shock, especially like on a motorcycle. Anytime you're moving mass, it's creating force. So this thing being so light, it it reacts so much better, especially like when you're on the road and small chop. Like, you know, the little road ripple we call them like the tar lines. Oh, I hate those. Yes. It's the worst, right? Yeah. And you... I'm driving a, uh, a 3500 truck right now. And I can, so in like deeper valleys in, uh, you know, at a, 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 over an overpass or things like that or a rut, it handles it beautifully. But in all the little stuff that's maybe only an inch deep or inch tall, it's I not, feel everything. You're going to feel absolutely everything. And then right right here, um, the, the whole, uh, I mean, our poor display shock has been in way too many dusty shows. Yeah, is. But you can actually see the three C-clip positions. So oh, depending right where you move this, okay, at the, actually... At the base of the main shaft, you've got the first one. Each one is about a half an inch from yeah, each other. Three quarters of an inch. Three quarters of an inch, So yeah. you, base, you have an um, inch and a half of total range. Uh, if you put a normal Jeep shock in, the longest one, you usually need to do some drive shaft things for the front drive shaft. Your brake lines, um, they need to be remounted. And so, well, you know, a lot of guys don't want to deal with that. They want to just put tires a simple lip. But then for the guys that are going full out and want the most uh, dropout, then they just drop one clip position. You let out nitrogen, you know what I mean? You can do a shock in five minutes, technically. That's brilliant. So just trying to make it easier long term. And I, uh, I just, well, on work spikes, we used to have spacers that we could go and, you know, sometimes the rider would be like, I just want my shock. A millimeter lower and we could throw in a different spacer and so that's kind of how this idea came but i was like let's just do c-clip positions and make it easy on everybody makes it more universal so with the bridge like 
typically this whole bridge and like whether it's a hose, whatever is coming off of and, here. And let's describe a bridge again. The bridge is the piece that is connecting the, the remote reservoir to the main shot body. Yeah, right? exactly. So, you know, this is all one piece, which is our preference. But sometimes like on that new vehicle we can't talk about, mm-hmm. we have to use a hose. And so, you know, spoil it up. <laughs> spoil it up. But one of the nice things when we go and we put this where the oil is coming out of the shock body is lower. When the piston actually crosses that point, the oil column going through the piston is more. So this whole bump zone area is stiffer automatically. And that's what I was referring to um, earlier. It's a, it's basically like a poor man's bypass. But it's 17, depending on what shock body and what shock shaft combination you have, it's like 17 to 20% more um, forces creating as it goes through with constant velocities. Instead of having to add bump stops, you kind of have it built into the shock already. Right. Why add more stuff when you don't need it? You know what I mean? And it's such a simple concept by lowering this. Right. Uh, I, I love it. It, it. Like UTVs, even on the Jeep. Because a Jeep, you really want to have that first initial thing loose, especially when you're rocks and all of that. But that way, when you really do hit something big, you know, our Jeep, we'll go through a sand wash. We're at Ocotillo and sand whoops, you know, one foot and a half sand whoops, and you can hit it 55 miles an hour. And having that zone just keeps it from that back end. The back ends on those are pretty prone to bottom. Right. Um, it just saves it. It's just an extra key feature. So we kind of have this room set up and... It's, it keeps evolving as we go and add more things. But every one of our electronic valves is actually tested before it goes into a shock. All of our small assembly parts are all built in the middle. And then we literally, as final assembly, it comes around. All of our shocks are vacuum bled. So we try to, once again, like, so everything is completely consistent. The vacuum bleeder always does a consistent job. One thing we notice is one guy bleeds a shock one way, one does another way it will give you a different feel. So for all of our vehicle stuff, everything is done that way. And then finally, what we do, every shot gets, when it gets a serial number, it's actually dyno tested. So we have a dyno graph of them, um, full stiff and full soft, like we test the electronic valve, just for consistency. And then that way we have a record of that shock, how it went out, and just to make do sure. Do you ship that with the, does it come in a booklet or anything, or you just keep it on file with a serial number? Yeah, we just have it on file. That's actually not a bad idea, though. It would be we pretty should, cool, we you know? Actually, we could print all four out on a graph and just put it with that set. That'd be pretty rad. Yeah. I mean, as, you know, like, it's, it's all about that first impression when you open that box. You spend all that money for the SDI system, and you open it up, and you're like, Damn, there's graphs of what mine did, not what the other guy's set did. Mine did this. No, That's kind of neat. That is actually good. And we, when we save the file name, it's just it's the serial number. It's going to cost you a Dr. Pepper, that idea. <laughs> that is. That's a yes, good idea. Is. Here we go. Uh, we're, we're actually even working with the Dino company right now on making the test uh, like just faster, more production-based. Because most of these dinos are done for R&D, but this one's solely in here just for um, basically quality. Gotcha. So one more time to wrap up this piece of, of our interview through SDI here. Your fitments, again, currently for the eClick system and a ballpark for the overall pricing. Um, so right now, Jeep, the JK, JL, JT, um, those systems are actually going to be coming out with a new price here, which, which is basically $4,500. Uh, we, we had a couple lower systems that were just discontinuing. Nobody wants, everybody wants the best, the pro. So we're just coming out with the base, our, our best system and streamlining it. Uh, that system, Carly system, which you actually can buy directly through Carly, one of their dealers. That one is 46 for the F250s. And then our Raptor system, depending on what shocks you already have and how your Raptor is configured. But if you have a 2020 Raptor, it's basically $1,799 for all the electronics, everything you need. Revalve on top of that, it's $800, $799. Am I missing anything? And where you go to Suspension Direct Inc. Dot com. What's the what's the uh, the website again? Suspensiondirect.com, or you can do SDI Racing. Both will link you there. Okay. We also have another website set up if you have more questions just about eClick. Just do eClickShocks.com, and it's got a lot of the videos, the how to, and more information just on the eClick brand. Okay, and eClickShocks.com. Yep, eclipshocks.com, right. and that's like really set up to help educate the customer and can answer so many of the questions because it is it's a total it's new technology and it's hard to explain it all. It, 
the best thing you can ever do is if you can come to one of our events to literally jump in the Jeep and try it. Because once you can experience it, it's like nothing else. Like one of our best compliments was Sage from Carly. You know what I mean? He didn't think anything of it. And one ride in the Jeep, he's like, we got to do this. And look where we're at now. It's quite an endorsement. No, it was. It was such a good compliment on, he's like, you guys nailed it. And he's like, I'm not impressed by many things. He flat out said that. He's like, this works really, really well. All right, so we're in a uh, two-liter turbo Jeep JL, and describe the setup that we have installed. So right now, full e-click setup, like our Active Pro, uh, full active suspension for the Jeep. And with our Jeep, it's actually the only vehicle we still have a manual mode in, and because just a lot of Jeepers are doing different things, and some just want that tunability to turn off the active. It doesn't seem like anybody uses it once they get used to the active modes, but. We're going to just do it real quick. So what we had done right now is we put the sway bar disconnect on. That way the sway bar is not affecting anything. And what we're going to do is go full stiff on the front and full stiff on um, the rear shocks. We just clicked it stiffer. And then what I like to do is we're just going to go and do S turns. And basically feel how much the Jeep moves and how much it rolls. Okay. So now, just with the click right there, slide the screen. Now we're going to be in full soft. Wow. That, oh, my Lord. That made an incredible so difference. You can basically just, you know, watching the horizon, uh, the Jeep's completely rolling. Like, you can just see how much influence the shocks actually have on, on the suspension and the vehicle. Uh, and what's so nice is we can have that soft ride but then as soon as you go in the um active modes when you need it that stiff to keep it from the body roll and being that loose it just does it and it does it only for that short period of time and then it can go back to a softer setting so you basically have best of both worlds another thing we can do um, i was waiting for traffic to clear there's a little bit more room here. We'll slow down. We're in an industrial area over here, and the mm-hmm. streets are empty after everyone's gone home. So you can just feel the wall oh, yeah. up. Wow, it's just really So now let's swaying. crank this thing back up. Okay. Much differ. So it basically goes and takes, you know what I mean? The, the roll and the... Basically, the attitude of the car completely changes. It's more of an on-road setting, but now you have that capability so easy. So what I want to do now is... is wild how dramatic that was. I want to basically get out at this point, and what I'm going to let you do is... um, We're going to go back to mode. I'm just going to put it in street active mode. And I want you to jump in the driver's seat, and we're going to just switch this up and let you go and experience it. All right, I'm going to hop out of the passenger seat. And into the driver's seat. Okay. Do you want me to hold the phone for you? Yeah, go ahead and hold this phone. All right. Well, and we're in straight. I'm going to just go ahead and put it back into a drive. Just go straight down, and there's a 90 degree corner at the end there, a dead end. Hit it as fast as you feel, like safe in a Jeep. I probably should have done it first because <laughs> you're not going to go as fast as what you think it could do. Where do you want me to do it? Um, the, the, right up here, this road dead ends. You got to turn left. Okay. I just want you to go follow this. I'm going to take you to our off-road course. All right. But in a normal Jeep, uh, when you set something off for off-road, a corner like this. So what's your feeling on that? Does that feel like a Jeep? No. That was very sports car. It's just you can do that now without even thinking about it. It really was very little body roll and just stuck to that turn. And... That is not that is not typical of a JL like this. The pedal monster now though is like getting after it. And it's like we're squeaking. <laughs> oh, what we're... you guys don't know is that uh, I had him try the pedal monster, and he was up in sport mode, and he's like smoking the tires. <laughs> so what I'm going to do for you right now is I'm going to um, change the mode. All right. We're going to go from um, from street mode to trail mode. What we're gonna do, we'll go ahead and we'll sort in four by four. Just go ahead and roll a little bit. Beautiful. Disconnect like what we would normally do if we're on the trail. roll these windows up so we can hear each other. Perfect. So now we're basically set up in trail mode. Okay. So let's go ahead. Go wherever you need to go. Let's see where these people are. I wanna drop my little pedal monster down into city. (laughs) Yeah, that's probably a good idea. So now we're coming down a hill. 
Wow, this is pretty rutted for Elsinore right here. <laughs> yeah, well, let's be done. Go ahead and stop with the Jeep with the nose pointed down. Go ahead and, okay. and see, look at your screen right now. So those were actually up at six, but the front were, were pointed down. So the front shocks right now are stiffer. Rear is actually full soft. No Because we don't Full need, soft in, in the rear. Yep. Stiffer in the front. Yep, stiff right now. We're yep. about halfway of the thing. When you actually hit so the brakes. My, my driver's side front corner um, is level two and my the passenger front is level three yeah what's bounce, max it actually will go to 10 oh well, so if okay. you want to really get going down this next hill and really stomp on the brakes and you'll look see, down you'll see you're gonna up. see probably eights or tens on this okay there oh there we got it you see that i saw an eight and a ten and then you notice how just this lower side went to ten yeah. but the actual higher side only went to eight that is so really it's compensating. Neat. So in trail mode is a lot more about vehicle positioning and basically keeping it more secure, but having that soft ride. Let's do that again. Oh, there it is. That was it. So I had seven and seven and nine uh, on the front. I don't know if you like true off roaders. Like they'll come off of a ledge, and what happens is a vehicle will go, and then the tire finally hits the ground, and the there's already that momentum of the vehicle rolling. And then most shocks set up for Jeeps have no low speed compression. So it just keeps on rolling. And that's when you see guys actual topple over. As that vehicle is going and let's say falling down a ledge and it's that steep, that right. lowest shock is gonna go all the way to 10. So not only, are, you're not just waiting for the spring to catch up and you know make enough force to stop it, the shock absorber is at full stiff. And you remember pulling on the handle with a display, when all of a sudden now you're, the thing is like a brick. It's super, rock solid. Rock solid. Yep. And so what it does is it slows that down, basically making the Jeep rock less. It's a more comfortable, flatter ride. And you don't have to worry about situations like that so much. Freaking brilliant. Well done, my friend. This is an impressive system. The E-Click really, this is neat. I need to get Holman out here to try this. Like he is a Jeep aficionado. Or we get him in a Raptor, or we get him in a Ford F-250, or we get him in... You said Ram is coming next, right? Uh, we're work. Yeah, it's one of the vehicles we're definitely working on. Gotcha. Yep. Wow. Actually, we want to... We actually want to look at the TRX and also, you know, coming up here, the... I might know Bronco. someone. I might, might know someone with a... Uh, they might have a TRX soon. That would work out perfect. All right. No, we're definitely interested. That... You know, we still haven't even driven in one yet. I, I want to try it, but... All right, well, you buy lunch and I'll come get you. All right, that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> and Holman, don't you agree that it's been way too long since we've checked into the Five Star Hotline, 657-205-6105? In fact, I do. Oh, come on and be part of the show. Call the Five Star Hotline, 657-205-6105. It's the Five Star Hotline. Five Star Hey guys, it's Jeremiah here. Uh, I'm a little behind, but I'm catching up. I'm on episode 118, but <laughs> I am currently driving my wife's uh, Chevy Tahoe because she has once again stolen my 2015 6.7 Power Stroke, and I can't help but notice the steering wheel is not centered. So, thanks, Sean. I hate you. Uh, keep up the good work, guys. You're welcome. Yep, that Tahoe, not centered on hey, that steering wheel. Can I just uh, point out to Jeremiah that he bought that truck, not me? Yeah, true. <laughs> What's up, fellas? This is Chance Q from Grappaholic, and I'm a relatively new listener. I just started doing a 100-mile-a-day uh, commute back and forth to work, and a podcast uh, really makes it go by quickly. Y'all is the one that I've been addicted to. I burned through three or four of them a week. So I started pretty far back. I'm at about 60 right now. And episode 61, the April Fool's podcast just got me. <laughs> it's September 5th, 2021. And in 2019, the end of March, I believe, y'all hosted a staticky, broken up uh, April Fool's podcast yes, about we some did. big news shocking the industry. Well, I'm in my daily driver beater, one of my mini trucks. Before he says it, what do, you, what do you think it is? He's a beater mini truck. What, what, what year? Probably what truck? Well, what truck? 89 Toyota. 
is a 92 Toyota pickup. <laughs> same, same body style. And the uh, stereo and everything isn't that great in it, but it does have Bluetooth. And I thought the speakers just let go. Uh, <laughs> I was trying, trying to get your podcast to play, and you got me. Uh, right now, I'm heading home from North Carolina back to work in Florida. Been checking on my mom, uh, as you would say, in South Park. She has a little bit of cancer. I uh, just found that out and went and checked on her. So the long drive home, I've listened to a couple podcasts. Just want to say uh, you guys keep me awake, keep me going. Uh, whenever I'm going anywhere, whether I'm in my first gen coming, um, pulling, you know, my 6.7 power strip swap into my 1957 truck project around. I got stuff all over the place. I'm always driving. And I appreciate you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. I hope to catch up to current date. But not too quickly because I don't want to run out of content. Thanks again. Y'all take care. Dude, chance. Very cool. Dude, we appreciate that. Hopefully your mom's doing okay. I know that it's been a while since you left that voicemail. So uh, we'll uh, keep your mom in uh, in our thoughts. And uh, thank you for uh, trusting us with your uh, drive home and keeping you awake. You know, your mom will get better a lot faster if she listens to the Truck Show podcast as well. And also gives us five stars. 657-205-6105 is the five-star hotline. Five star. Five star. Five star. Five star. Hey guys, so uh, this is Aaron. So I got a 0154 F-150. Um, it's bone stock, um, completely 100% stock, except for I have like 32 inch tires on it. But basically, motor wise, it exhausts everything stock. I was wondering, I've been wanting to put a 3 inch uh, Mach Force uh, AFE cat back. And I was just wondering what you guys thought about um, a cat back system. Like, do you think that it would lean out my fuel map and lean out my motor and actually make it run worse? Or do you think it would run just fine and it's not enough to do anything and I can... uh, I know I'm not going to make a huge gain of horsepower torque, but I just want... You know, I want it to sound like a truck. I want it to sound like a V8. You know, I want to hear my truck when I start it and when I get on it a little bit, you know. And, uh, yeah, so, but the biggest thing that's keeping me from away away from that is I don't want to hurt my motor. Like, I love this truck. You know, it, it runs strong, and, you know, I want it to run as best as it can. I don't want it to run too lean. Um, so, I'm just wondering what you guys thought about that, putting a cat back on a bone stock truck and not tuning uh, the the map, you know. Let me know what you guys think. All right, bye. Uh, yeah, that's an easy one. So, uh, oh one Ford F one fifty. So, Aaron, basically, here's the deal. Uh, go for it, because all you're gonna do is make the air pump that is your engine more efficient. Uh, back then, you know, we're talking about oh one. That's twenty years ago. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. You didn't have to worry about – it's sort of the magical era when intake, exhaust, and headers would probably get you anywhere between 10 and 18% horsepower and torque and probably a couple miles per gallon of efficiency. Today's vehicles, the ECU, the computer computing power is so much more advanced, and because of the EPA requirements, all the manufacturers are wringing every ounce of power and efficiency of those things out at the factory level. But back then, there was always a little bit of gain you could get. So feel free. You're not going to lean it out. You don't need to have it tuned. Most of those vehicles have no problem adjusting in, uh, it for a, for a cat-back. No issues there. Uh, but you should do a intake with it as well. On that motor, you'll probably see a, a nice little bump. And, uh, yeah, feel free to do it, and you'll be good. I don't know if – And I was going to say, it's weird how there's some misconceptions over, you know, cat-backs or exhaust in general. You know, if you could dump right after the headers – your engine would run better. You, yeah. you can't for you can't obvious, cats and for cats that, yeah. legal reasons, obviously. Yeah. But no, you don't. There's some. There's a. There's a crazy wives' tale that you need some back pressure, and that's just. That's just. It couldn't be more bogus. If if like I said, if you could just chop it off of the headers, your engine would run better. Yeah. You know. Yes. It's just like you, breathing through a straw. You can get into scavenging and stuff like that, but yeah. that's not. That don't worry about that. The answer that Holman gave is accurate. Go ahead and bolt on a cat back. Go to our, reach out to our friends at uh, at Borla potentially. They make some really nice ones. If you want to sound, uh, they probably have an attack um, and get it you know raspy sounding like the V8 you want to drive. So uh, go for it. Yeah, Lightning Holman. Just listening to the episode with uh, Matt from Smoking Tire, and you were talking about branding and vehicles back in the eighties. And I'm sorely disappointed that Holman did not come up with Levi's and Jeep. Uh, just thought I would point that out. Probably not first. Y'all have a good day. Awesome. 
later. Nope. nope he's not, not the, first. the first. Not even close. But thank you. 657-205-6105 is the five-star hotline. Hey, Lightning and Holman. Lightning was saying about how he feels that uh, co-branding with apparel companies is a fairly recent development. <laughs> Come uh, on. Ah. In uh, the mid-70s, AMC paired with Levi's to offer Levi edition AMC Gremlins. And also in the uh, 90s, Eddie Bauer paired with Ford for Eddie Bauer edition Ford Explorers. Not terribly recent development, co-branding with the Ferrell Company. Uh, two yeah. things to say about that. Yeah. One is uh, you are <laughs> going to have to live that one down as people find that episode and then yell at you for mm-hmm. it. And two, he was. I get co- back at them, by the way, for the with the April Fool's gag. <laughs> That's true. Did you hear that he was calling from the future, from yes. a time machine? <laughs> boop, 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 boop. I noticed that. <laughs> Lightning Homer and Mike Boyle. I uh, just want to congratulate Lightning on his new uh, purchase that he's about to take, you know, eventually take hold of. But uh, just wanted to let him know the minute he puts twenty fours on that, we're going to hunt him down and really make him think twice about his decisions. <laughs> just kid. Have a good one. Five star. Five star review. Five stars. So I will have you know that I would not dare put a set of twenty fours on a TRX. Wouldn't do it. Not going to. Twenty sixes. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 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 Hey, just calling because I like to listen to your show with my dad on a on long road trip, and uh, I want to say that. Everything that you guys guys do is great. Do you know where I can find any stuff for an F100, like a 70 bump slide F100, like body body wise? Second thing, on your own opinion, what is the best truck Ford has ever made? And on that, what is the best? What is your most favorite truck ever? All right, so those are some great questions. But the first thing I want to ask you back is, what is what, his name? No. We don't. He didn't leave his name. What are you, a cop? <laughs> like, like, what, what, what's up with all the questions? I know he's kid? killing us, right? Yeah. Uh, this is easy for me. All right. So uh, F100 bump mm-hmm. side. I would go to LMC Truck. They have uh, most of the body panels and all the stuff that you'll need for that. What um, about uh, Brothers Trucks? Uh, I don't know if they have F100 stuff. Check there. And then also Holly uh, just released a bunch of classic truck stuff. They're starting on the Chevy side. I don't know if they've moved to Ford yet, but uh, definitely worth keeping your eye open over there. But uh, uh, lots of lots of F100 parts out there, finally. I'll tell you what it's like to drive a 67 F100 uh, bump side. But you can't. But it's been five years. Yes. It's been sitting uh, at Banks for five years. And at some point, Holman's going to, uh, we're going to trailer it out of there and he's going to finish it. Because yes, apparently I'm... I've come up empty-handed and uh, and unable to finish it. If you want to couch it that way, fine. But for our listeners, uh, stay tuned. Well, there's some there's some things brewing. The old okay. uh, the old speed bump. It's gonna be what, on the road again. What's the best truck that Ford has ever made? And and forgive me, but I gotta say, a brand new Ford F two fifty. Mine would be the ninety nine F two fifty Super Duty seven three. Okay, that's because, that's strong because those trucks were super overbuilt for what they were rated at. It was the first time that the manufacturers split into a separate heavy duty truck line, and it had the uh, direct injected uh, Power Stroke seven three, which is the stalwart of the diesel side. So yeah, I know, but it's awesome. It's, but it's not uh, fine, but it it's simple. It doesn't ride as good. It, oh, it rides like the, crap. It doesn't have the accoutrement. The accoutrement that you will need. Accoutrement. Lightning, look at me. Yeah. Look at me. Yes, it has. Power locks, power windows, and a seat. Like, what, like, what more do you need? Like, doesn't need a Kutramah, you know? It, it's, those trucks were awesome. So I'm all about that first generation Super Duty 7.3 4x4 F250. I think it was like a Dana 50 front and like a 60 rear or something like that. Leaf sprung. Everything's just super overbuilt on it. That's going to be mine. And then it says, uh, what's our most favorite truck ever? Hmm. Oh, boy. Wow. What's your favorite truck ever? Oh, that's interesting. I, I need to think about it here for a second. I I've got a I I just have to. I, there's a couple. Um, my favorite sport truck ever is a Ram SRT10. Okay. Regular cab with the manual transmission because that was the first time I drove a factory pickup that had. It might have been the first time I ever drove anything over 500 horsepower. And the Lightning was awesome, but I didn't like the body style of the Lightning back then. Although a first-generation Lightning, like our friend uh, Matt DeAndrea, his is awesome. 
Yeah. So those two are sort of my favorite on the sport truck side. I could almost fade into 454 SS a little bit, but I didn't like the interior. I love the body style, but hate the interior on those trucks. And then for like my favorite all around truck ever, if I had to live with just one truck and now, do everything, there, there's can I can I throw this into the mix here? For me, I, I immediately think of like modified trucks. Should I not? Should I be thinking of a stock truck? Like one of no, a, a, a truck that I will always want, a truck that I will always want and never have, is a slammed, a brand new either Ford F three fifty dually or like a GMC thirty five hundred diesel on the ground body dropped. Body dropped I mean, scraping the earth, I won't ever have one. But mm. I, though that's something that I will lust after till the day I die. So for me, the best truck ever, TRX, man. I've, that thing is just a beast. It's everything. It's luxurious. It's comfortable. It's quiet. It it just mobs in the desert. Uh, you can absolutely just tear up the road. Did I tell you I got beat this week? Uh, no. It's so disappointing. You were beat by what? Oh. Let me guess. Can I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got beat by well, you wouldn't race a Porsche because no. you'd probably that would be a dumb competition, sure. right? Ooh, okay, you would have okay. Wait, ah, oh, I bet it was another Mopar product. Nope, no, no. Okay, all right. Who else would race Holman? Oh, I got it. It's a um, some Japanese product, like a nope. uh, guy with a, a no, really no. not a Skyline or something. No. Oh, geez. Okay, he murdered out. Yeah. Nothing other than tires. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. wait. And, I gotta keep guessing. This is it slammed. It, is it a car or a truck? It's a car. Okay, it's a car. It's a car. Is it a is it a vet? Nope. Not a Corvette. Oh my god. Is it is it American made? Nope. Oh geez. Uh okay, wait, I know, I know, I know. Slammed Audi RS set R R S seven, but the, the even the better one. Nope. Like, no. I don't know. Volkswagen don't. Golf GTI R32. <laughs> Smoked the crap out of me, dude. No kidding. So I, I, I saw him. He looks at me and he just kind of looks. I'm like, uh-huh. I'm curious, right? I'll bite. Because uh-huh. this, this isn't a Rebel. This is a TRX. And I mash it. And he mashes it. And I can hear the turbo. Whoop, passes me. Misses the shift. I go whoop, bat, past him. He grabs it again and then passes me. I was like. Whoa. You so, don't want to be that guy. <laughs> Nobody wants to be that guy. No, so, no one wants to be Holman right there. So I got to, I, listen, I just got to give props. And this, of course, was in Mexico on a uh, on a private area, on Why private property. Why do people say that? You're racing in the streets of Southern California. No, Kentucky. it wasn't a race. Who it was cares? not a race. It was just, it, we didn't you, go over the speed limit. That's it right. Was just, it was just a little spurt down a private driveway. Uh-huh. Listen, he looked over at me and I gave him the nod. I wasn't even mad. And it was rad. It was totally blacked out. Everything black, wheels, but stock wheels or stock looking wheels anyway. Looked like a plus zero tire on it. Slammed. I probably put my my palm of my hand between the body. Perfectly, the fitment was perfect with the edge of the fender flares. You're talking about, so there's the, not much room between the top of the tire yep. and the fender wheels. Okay. It perfectly stand. That's everything not, that's nice. not slammed. Slammed is when they're tucked all the no, way. No, they weren't, they weren't tucked. That's okay. why this thing is so a total sleeper. So we had co- coilovers or something in there. He, For he, sure. He wasn't on bags. No, no, no. But there's nothing about it. And he had a rad plate. Something to do with Volkswagen. Yeah, well, or I can't right? remember now, but it was like D A S, like Das, yeah. Das, my R, or something like that. And I was like, "Yes, it is." Like I wasn't even mad. I just looked at him like, "You, dude, right on. Good for Some you." Some of those rip. dude. That dude goes hunting for everything. That's like when you're when you're swinging your big axe, if you know what I mean, right? And then somebody rolls up in a. I don't even know how to go further well, with this analogy. No, well, well, just, well, just don't. But this is kind of the reason that that I had talked about getting that F one fifty with the Whipple supercharger for the longest time because yeah. I thought I'm going to roll up. You know, I'm a little lower, but it does. It looks like a freaking boring truck, right? And you just roll up on say I could be in Newport Beach and roll up on a Lamborghini and smoke him. Yeah. Assuming that I have four wheel drive, yeah. two wheel drive, yeah. he he lose, he'd lose me. Yeah. But it was like if he was a two wheel drive Huracan, even a four wheel drive, and I had a, a Ford F one fifty with a big blower on it, I'd leave him, yeah. and they'd go like, "I just spent three hundred fifty thousand dollars on this bull, and this guy with a pony yeah. just blasted me." Yeah, with a with a stupid old truck. Yeah. Uh, anyway, got to chalk one up to the V Dub guys because, uh, dude, I got to give him. I've got to get him props. I was like, like I said, dude, I wasn't even mad. I just, <laughs> I, I, I like was smiling a little bit, like. All right. Well, what's he like? Two thirds your weight? Yeah, I mean, half yeah, the prob- weight, probably. And I don't know. Is five? It's got to be five hundred horsepower or four fifty or something to be able to pull that hard. Right. 
I mean, it was it was <laughs> impressive. So when dude. he dr- when he grabbed the gear, yeah. he just squatted uh, and bailed. Yeah, gone. Like warp drive, and then he ran out of gear, and I don't know if he missed a shift or had a, a trouble between, you know, a couple gears. But I, I yanked on him, okay. and then I saw him get it, and he was gone. You know, so like, you pull up, you pull up to the light at the same time afterwards. And? Afterwards, and I just looked at him, and and the TRX. Did you did you roll the windows down? No, no, no. Like, the TRX didn't. is so tall. Oh, you couldn't see. I him. could only see the bridge of his nose and up, and I saw <laughs> just him looking over, and I just went, I kind of gave him the nod, and then I just saw his. His sunglasses move up like he was giving me the nod, too. And I was like, gotcha. Dude, respect, brother. <laughs> respect. I wish I had an analogy for it. It just seems like, uh, you know, oh, I know. You're, it's like uh, David and Goliath or something. Or like you're in, you're in the ring and it's like a match and you're like the big heavyweight. And then this little dude just kicks you in the nuts. Like you, if you could get him, you could crush him. But he's so little and fast, he just got you right in the nuts and you crippled and collapsed right to the ground. I mean, look, dude, that, that truck is just so freaking big. Dude, it weighs 6,500 pounds. Come right, on. Right, right. Or more. So he's got to look back and go, not bad for a truck, right? right? For sure. Right. No, I'm looking at him going, I didn't expect that. He was looking at me going, okay, all right. Yeah. No, it was, it was mutual respect. It was, it was, there's no. We need to, has, no, has, hey. has Dustin Whipple come out with his supercharger for the TRX yet? I, not not no. that I know. I know, I know that, that, is the 7.3 out yet? Because I know there's a little bit of a delay on that. I know that um, there's some rumor that it's coming. Yeah, I've we, heard, we should I've heard, talk to him about that. Yeah, somewhere. we do need to catch up because that's going to be – you could drop some E85 into that with his supercharger and be well over 1,000 horsepower, and then you'd pull. Can uh, you imagine dude, that? I don't want to – yeah, but here's the thing. I don't need any of that. I don't want to be dropping U joints everywhere. So yeah, good point. You okay, know, some some point I just want to hit the button. All right, well, it. Holman got his ass kicked. Truck right. Show Podcast, episode 214, coming to a close. That's a lot of show. Thank you guys for tuning in. Leave us a five-star review if you don't mind. Do it on Apple Podcasts or now on Spotify. The Truck Show. The Truck Show. The Truck Show. Whoa, whoa. All right. If you want to send us a note, truckshowpodcast at gmail.com. Truckshowpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to uh, follow us on social, at LBC Lighting, at Sean P. Holman, or at Truck Show Podcast. Been doing my best to keep up with those uh, DMs and PMs and private messages a lot. and everything else. Yeah, so but keep sending them our way, and we appreciate tips. I mean, I got to be honest. The first time I was tipped off to uh, the guys at SDI was one of our listeners. One of you guys said, "Hey, I've got this uh, on my Jeep, and uh, I, I need everybody to know about it." So yep, we you guys sent us a lot of good stuff. Hey, there's a bunch of stuff that if we need content, we can just go through our DMs because you guys send us so much stuff. So. Keep that coming. We love uh, talking to you. I always try and, you know, got the regular crew that sends, you know, five or six people that are always DMing me. But I always get back to you guys. Maybe not the same day, but I always get back to you guys. Maybe not even the same week, week. or month. <laughs> yeah, yes. it depends how busy I am or what I'm doing at that moment. We need to hire a social media kid. We really do. You know what's funny? Is, well, we have one, but he's not full-time to us. No, and he posts stuff that's like six weeks old. You know, it's fun. well, that's because I get it to him six weeks afterwards. Well, then you're a jackass. Do you think the guys that are getting my responses on DM... Go, wow, he always DMs me at the exact same time during the day, during this one little window. Uh, no, I don't think they're thinking about it. I don't. I am, because I'm always DMing at the exact same time when I'm sitting and thinking. I'm sure you are. Yeah. Sitting and thinking. Is that how you're, uh, <laughs> yeah. you're, yeah, yeah, sitting you're and couching thinking. it? Hey, uh, so what do we got going on for next week? Anything good? Nope. No. Okay. Well, Vapid, the, arid wasteland of uh, podcast Don't audio. ever uh, listen to the show again anymore, people. No, it'll be good. It'll be good. It'll be good. All right. Oh, we're talking to our buddy Billy Creech. Oh, Desert Explorer. Desert Explorer <laughs> Billy, Billy Creech. Creech, yes. And we'll be talking more about our event that is coming up in April. I think uh, the details are being solidified, but if you if you can be in the Southern California desert area in April, um, third weekend free, or something, third we'll, weekend, we'll give you more details. Later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's going to be cool. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna camp with you and have some beers out in the uh, under the stars in the desert. So hey, we need to thank uh, Nissan and Bank. So first, Nissan, if you're looking for um, a phenomenally bulletproof truck and you want a, a great midsize reliable rig. Look no further than the Nissan Frontier. It's all new. The front end is gorgeous and mean. You got the stereo, the nine-speed Jacko transmission. You got Utilitrack in the bed. Best-in-class horsepower from the 3.8-liter V6. Zero-gravity seats. The bottom line is get over to your local Nissan dealer or just build and price yours at NissanUSA.com. All right, and if you guys are out there with your uh, Ram 2500 or 3500 with the 6.7 Cummins, you have a stock elbow that kills airflow into your engine. If you head over to bankspower.com, you can get all that power back, everything that you lost, and gain a more responsive, 
power-efficient engine. You can improve airflow from the intercooler, raise boost without increasing back pressure at the turbine, and it retains all emissions equipment for 50-state compliance. Head over to BanksPower.com and you want to check out the Monster Ram. That's right. That's right. Gen 2, available now. Oh, and if you... uh you're really serious about some big stuff just slide into lightning's dms you might be able to hook up a truck show podcast brother or sister if you know what i mean mm-hmm. i have done it before and i will do it again can't really make it public so just uh, just talk to me on the side you know what i'm saying, what I'm saying? Mm. and the monster m is the it, it definitely is the hot lick it is a it's, it's the not hot a, lick is it the beans it's the beans okay yes Holman. before we end uh this show do you mind if we go to a special guest this guy has been hounding us for quite some time to get on the podcast. This is a former- For about four years. For about four years. This was a former regular guest on the Kevin and Bean Morning Show on K-Rock in Los Angeles, yes. where I produced and I was there forever, blah, blah, blah. And I became friends with this guy. I don't know when I met him, but it's 20 years ago, something like that. You sure. And uh, he's been after me and home, and somehow he got a hold of you on Facebook yeah, and he regularly blows me up, and uh, I've been back and forth with him for years. And finally, the other night, he he hit me up again, said saying I want to be on the show, and I go, "It's got to be about trucks." And he goes, "Oh, so it's not like the Kevin and Bean or Janky Town or anything." I'm like, "No, haven't you ever heard a show?" And he goes, "No, I've never listened to it." <laughs> I'm like, "Seriously?" Yeah. So I gave him homework, and uh-huh. at this point, he says he's listened to three of them. So I want to see. If he did, I have a homework assignment I want to give him, but we're not putting on the show unless he passes this test right here. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, so let's dial Doe Toe. Oh, by the way, it's D-I-E-U. That's his first name, and his last name is Toe, T-O. So when you say it fast, everyone thinks it's like one word. It's not. It's first and last name, Doe Toe. Doe Toe. And this is a real dude. Like This isn't some made-up morning no, show no, no, character. No. Like no, this, this guy is, exists. Yeah. He lives in Westminster, and even, California. And even back then, people were going, is this guy real or is he is he just a, like a sketch character or something? No, he's a real guy. He's legit. Yeah. And I know that because even you know uh, when I helped to start the Kevin and Bean page, people would be asking about him. I'm like, no, the dude texts me all the time. He's, <laughs> he's a real, real. He's literally everything you hear about him, that's uh, true. Yeah. Because my phone's blowing up with, Hey, can we get on the podcast? I mean, literally, four years of asking to get on this damn podcast, never listened to one of them. <laughs> Not once. Not oh. once. Cracks me up. All right, well, I just gave you his number, and you're going to have to dial from your phone, which means that he's going to be able to now text you. So uh, sorry about that in advance. Go ahead and dial Mr. Doto so we can end the show on a really awesome note, because I'm really excited about this. About 50% more excited than I am. <laughs> okay, well, dial Doe. Toe. Please leave your message for seven one four three. <laughs> okay, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. I'm gonna, I'm pick gonna, it up. No, I'm gonna send him to voice. No, 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 no. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. There we go. Pick it up. There we go. Is this uh, Mr. Doe Toe? Come on now, Doe. He just hung up. What the hell? <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Who's this, Jay? What's up? Hello, Doe. It's it's Lightning and oh, Mr. Course, Sean I, Holman. Of course I know it's Lightning. It's, it's, of course I know it's Lightning. It's been, never forget your voice, Lightning. It's, I know. Since, since November of 2020. No, 2000. Sorry. I was just thinking too much, man, from, from my past. Sorry about that. When you say 2020, we have known no, each well, other no, since I like mean, 20, no, I mean, 2010. I, I, mean, I mean, November of, two, of 2000. That, that, that is when, when we met with Caesar. <gasps> we met in 2000? Yes. I, got, I was screaming like a, like a hiatus at the, at the student bourbon. Hey, That's, hey, Doe. Yeah. Doe, did you also yeah. meet Lightning at the Real Big Fish uh, Wow store uh, in Long Beach, California? No, that was you, Holman. Oh, that was me. I, yeah, I, like I didn't, I didn't go, there. I didn't go, I didn't, I didn't, I don't, I don't recall meet him, meet him at the Wild Fish. I only met Lightning. Back yeah, yeah. In November two thousand at the Kevin Bean stuff. Yeah, where Kevin did we Bean. meet? You, uh, your friend Caesar introduced us. Is that correct, though? Yes. Okay, and you have a he has a wild like hyena laughter. That, yeah, that's can, me. Can you give us a, a flavor of what that might sound like if uh, you were to do it now? Hey man, I, mean, I can't do that because my old man's at the end of the house. Sorry about that. It's, oh. it's like people call me the bird, the, the, the bird man. The bird man. The bird man. Okay. Yeah. All right, Joe. You know, yeah, I've got, yeah. I, we've got a question for you. So we're, we're having you. We, 
you have been chasing us for four years to come on the podcast. And yes. we have gone back and forth on DMs, you and myself and you and Lightning. Yeah. And I was shocked to find out that after all of the hounding that you have done to be on the Truck Show podcast, you have never listened to one until the other day when I said, dude, listen yeah, to yeah. one. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I know. I, I, it's my fault. I, 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 I said I'm going to wake up and smell the coffee and just do my, my work. I don't know. Sometimes, 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 sometimes I'm just laying in a damn, damn, in, in a, in a damn bed just watching Netflix. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Well, have, have you done your homework? Do you have any sort of truck content or truck review for Lightning and I? Uh, you know what? I'm 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 about to do it tomorrow. Okay. He's, he's right. So That's, you will prepare convenient. a truck review tomorrow, and then the next time we check in with you, Doe, as an official guest on the Truck Show podcast, yeah, yeah, well, you will give hey, us. Light, hey, Lightning! I don't have a woman, Lightning. Oh no! You would if you had a truck, Doe. Yeah, That's true. Yes. You know the chicks it's... love trucks. Yes, sir. So let me ask you, Doe, what type of truck do you think would be most attractive to a, a lady friend? Yeah, what I like, I like to, to drive a Ford Runner. To oh, Toyota Ford. Ford, Runner. Ford Runner. Oh, a Ford Runner. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Would you have a rooftop tent on the top? You know, I, I never, be, possibly, I, 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 can, I, can get, I can give that a thought, yeah. Would you go camping? I never done it, but, but I like to try it. If you have a Ford Runner in Southern California, Doe, you have to have 18 sets of lights on it, as well as a rooftop tent, a ladder rack, extra cans for water and fuel, and you have to go camping. Those are the rules. I don't make them up. Those are just the rules. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know, Lenny. I'm, 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 I'll do my research, and then, then I'll find it. I, I got it, Lenny. Okay. So what we'd like to do, Joe, is uh, we're going to give you an assignment. We're going to give you a truck, probably a new vehicle, and we're going to have you review it because that's what a lot of our um, – I don't know. That's what Holman does. He'll go and test drive a new vehicle. Uh, he'll go down to like a Nissan dealer and he'll test drive a new Frontier or something like that. And then he'll come back and give us his driving impressions. I liked it, its acceleration. I like the radio. Uh, I didn't like this. I like that. Those types of things. And we'd like you to bring us a review. Give us some color and make it come to life. You know, yeah, on this I, podcast. I, I'll, I'll take care of that. Just give me an assignment and I'll and I, and I get to work on that. Perfect. Okay. All right. We have two assignments because I'm going to give you another one, Doe. Your two yeah. assignments are this. You're going to do a truck review for us. Yes. But I also want you to go to the Banks Power website and pull a product off there and do an ad read off the website. Oh, I love okay, that. 30 seconds. 30 seconds about Banks Power. Something I, you, know you find on there. I'd like to give him that part instead. Yeah. No, I, no, no, it's no. It's way no, more no. fun. He doesn't know anything about trucks. I know, but way funnier for him to do <laughs> but it. But what if he pulls like a, uh, I don't know, a, yes. a downpipe from like a seven three? Even or something. better, you know, really. I hope that happens. Okay, yeah. So just, just so, 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 so just do a review of th- th- thirty seconds on the Bank Power. Website. Yeah, just go to the Bank's Power website, find a product you like, and then make a thirty second commercial. So if you go to bankspower.com dot com, yeah. and then you find a like a widget, you're like, oh, what's this? red powder coated machined aluminum awesomeness you read about the description on banks power and then you convince lightning and i to buy it i like it yeah okay i got it. i got it i mean you're you're good at salesmanship right doe yeah okay all right then one last thing nissan i need you to go to nissanusa.com and do the same thing find a nissan truck that you like and then do a 30 second commercial for nissan truck yeah i'll do that yeah yeah so, okay. so three things, a truck review, a commercial for Banks Power, and a commercial for Nissan Trucks. Both of the commercials, 30 seconds. Your review can be like five minutes. Got it. Got now, it. this is interactive, right? The review is you and I will, will talk to him. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk him through it. Okay, we'll help you through it, Joe. So I know it's, it's going to be your first one. So we've done a lot of these, and, and we'll help you through it. So you just come with the big things like, here's what I like, here's what I don't like, so and then we'll we, talk through it. We should have yeah. a segment called Doe Does Trucks. I love that. Yeah. Doe does trucks, and from time to time, you have to give us a truck review of something. Yeah. It could be new. Yeah. It could be old. It could be something you found walking around your neighborhood, something yeah. interesting. You could. It could be an old Toyota Tacoma that's all rusty and clapped out yes. with a homeless person living in it. That's fine. Or it could be a yes. brand new Frontier at the Nissan dealership, whatever you want to yes. do. Got it. But we got to get a truck review from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, Doe, can you do me a favor and go into the garage or out back in the backyard and give us a uh, your your hyena laugh? Because our listeners need to uh, understand the the majesty of the Doe voice. 
Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. It's worth the wait. Yeah, I remember this back in the day. Yeah, man, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I can't do it. The old, the old man's there. Sorry. He, he, wait, wait, he's wait, in the backyard. Where, where? Where's the old man? At, at my damn home. I know that. That's why I asked you to go into the garage or go out in the backyard. You know what? We, we have guest over, so it's probably not a great <laughs> oh, night. Listen Maybe to me, another, backtrack. Another night sure. Are you embarrassed? That is a embarrassed. signature. That's like my whiny high voice. Your signature is the hyena laugh. Yeah, man, because people is people in my house, man, I thought that if they're not there, I, I, I would do that. Like, Wait, but don't they know you? They know me, but I never, but I never did that noise in so, front of them. So that would shock them? Yeah, yeah, that would shock them. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. All right, yeah, well, just, listen, mm-hmm. as part of your next appearance on the Truck Show podcast, you're going to have to do your uh, your marquee, your signature noise. Uh, hyena whale. Hy- hyena yeah, whale, yeah. Yeah, of course. All right, Doe, here's you, the deal. You, you know about that noise. I got it. Like, if, I got this, it. if this is your, if you want to come back on the show, this is your chance to come yeah. to Doe Does Trucks. I love yeah, that title, by the way. All right, All right. Doe, before we let you go, do you have a clean joke? Ross Perot. That's a clean joke. <laughs> sure. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks, All right. Thanks, Thank you, Joe. Joe. We're, we're, uh, no, very, we're no, going to check back in nothing, with you. Nothing like a timely joke for right. the funny. Okay. Perfect. All yes, right, yes, sir. Th- thanks, thanks, buddies. All, All right. right. Thanks. Bye. Oh, bye. Bye. Well, let's see what kind of review he does. That's uh, that's what I'm interested in. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, enough of that craziness for. Uh... Okay, so we're uh, we're leaving you uh, on that note. <laughs> uh, goodbye, buddies. <laughs> Bye, buddies. The Truck Show Podcast is a production of Motor Trend Group. This podcast was created and produced by Sean Holman and Jay Tillis with production elements by DJ Omar Khan. If you like what you've heard, please head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. And if you're a fan of the Truck Show Podcast, we encourage you to visit and patronize our sponsors. 